Flirting with the Biker by Verna DePaul. Narrated by Ellen Lang. Chapter 1 It will be a good investment, Jill Jones told Liz Monroe, her friend and partner in her daycare business. Five tablets the older kids can use for learning and the occasional game. What do you think? Sounds great, Liz said, lazily sliding her fingertip over the rim of her glass. I know the kids would love the tablets. We can deduct the cost at the end of the year, along with the wireless internet. Great, Jill signed her credit card bill. You ready to go? Not just yet. You want another drink? Nope. But if I was ten years younger, I'd order me a tall, dark, tattooed, and sexy. And I'd start with Mr. TDTS sitting at the bar right now. Jill laughed. Is TDTS really that much younger than you? Maybe he likes his women well-seasoned. She put her wallet back in her purse. Some men do, honey, but in this case, I'd say the guy likes the looks of you. Jill glanced over at him. Wow. Mr. TDTS gave new definition to the word big. He was more like a one-man NFL team. Dark hair, black t-shirt with short sleeves that showed off big, muscular, well-defined arms covered with colorful tattoos. His face sported a day's worth of dark stubble. His jeans were well-worn and he definitely wore them well. With those chest muscles rippling underneath his cotton t-shirt, he radiated masculine power. Abruptly, he turned, and she glanced down and away, struggling to keep her expression cool and composed. She couldn't help it and looked again. He was staring. Then came his smile, slow, a shade shy of cocky. She imagined herself standing right up and strolling over there. The beer she'd had must be playing with her head. A guy like that, someone who belonged on the cover of a romance novel, wouldn't want someone like her, plain Jane Jill Jones, who ran a daycare for a living. Even so, the longer they'd held each other's gazes, the more she'd imagined him taking her into a hidden corner of the bar to kiss her. Only it wouldn't stop with a kiss. Jill... At the sound of Liz's voice, Jill jerked and turned back to her friend. She'd practically forgotten she was there. I'm sorry, what did you say? Liz laughed. It's okay. I wouldn't be thinking coherently if he'd been looking at me like that either. Anyhow, I was just saying that I need to take off. Don't forget, I'll be in late and Monica will be there for a couple of hours to help out. I won't, but I think I'm going to take off too. Jill's voice came out sounding too perky, even to her own ears. Maybe because she could still feel a certain man's eyes on her. Aw, you don't want to leave yet, Tinkerbell. The proximity of the male voice startled her. She turned towards the man who'd spoken, a guy in an expensive suit. His hair was short, spiky, and crispy with styling product. His friend was almost an exact replica. They'd been standing near Jill and Liz, playing darts for the past half hour, occasionally throwing a comment their way. So far, Jill and Liz had managed to ignore them. Put off by his slurred words and lopsided smile, she turned away. Hey, beautiful, I'm talking to you. Jill bristled, but before she could respond, Liz said, Sorry, but the lady's not interested. Jill had her back mostly to the guy, but she caught sight of him out of the corner of her eye, sidling up to their table. Aw, oh, come on, my friend bet me I couldn't get you to kiss me. That was a safe bet on his part, Jill said. The man smirked, put a $20 bill down on the table in front of her and said, After we kiss, it's yours to keep. Appalled, Jill and Liz exchanged glances, then Jill fully faced the man. I'd appreciate it if you took your money and left. Nothing here is for sale. The man, taking this as a challenge, stepped even closer. Jill could smell the whiskey on his breath. Come on, just one little kiss. She said no more than once, but I could use twenty bucks. A deep male voice spoke from her other side. Come here, and I'll kiss you. Jill swiveled around. The tall, tattooed man from the bar had joined them. His focus was on whiskey breath. 
Despite his joking words, he looked beyond annoyed even before Whiskey Breath snapped. Leave us alone. The man must truly be drunk. Anyone could see that Mr. TDTS could wipe the floor with the drunk exec with one flick of his finger. But something in the big man's eyes, strangely enough, made Jill feel calmer, safe. Well, now you've gone and hurt my feelings, her rescuer drawled. His eyes, a warm chocolate brown with golden flecks, briefly met Jill's before returning to his prey. That was the only way Jill could think to describe it. He was a predator who'd managed to hold himself in check thus far. But with his coiled muscles and that dark look in his eyes, he was more than ready to pounce. Jill mentally urged the man who'd been bothering her to turn around and walk away. If he didn't, she had no doubt he'd be buying himself a world of trouble. Almost as if she were seeing things unfold in slow motion, Jill watched as Whiskey Breath stepped around her chair and threw a punch at Mr. TDTS, who easily grabbed the other man's fist in midair. In two seconds, Whiskey Breath was face down, kissing the table, arm pinned behind his back. Mr. TDTS looked first at Jill, then at Liz. I'm sorry about all this, ladies. Some people just don't know how to act in public. The drunk guy's friend was already headed out the door. Mr. TDTS fished the guy's keys out of his pocket. You're going to call a cab. The keys will be at the bar when you sober up. He dragged the other man out the front door while several people around them clapped and cheered. Jill stared after them and eventually snapped shut her gaping mouth. Mr. TDTS looked like trouble but acted like Prince Charming. I like it, she thought. Her heartbeat sped up a bit and adrenaline rushed through her. Wow! Liz gazed after the men with stars in her eyes. Can't wait to see what happens when he comes back in. If Liz could only see the images running through Jill's mind. Having that beautiful man throw her over his shoulder and take her someplace private so she could properly thank him for his assistance wouldn't even begin to describe her gratitude. Didn't you say you had to leave? Jill teased in order to throw Liz off the scent. Her breathing was accelerated and she could feel a deep blush warming her cheeks. Thank goodness the lights were low. Did I? Liz laughed. Okay, fine, I'm leaving. You be good. And by good, I mean get to know that man better because I'm sure he'll be very good. Then her face grew serious. But be careful. Maybe I should stay. Jill shook her head. Go, I'll be fine. I'm not going to do anything stupid, I promise. Liz sighed. Too bad safe and stupid are rarely the same thing. She gave Jill a hug. Call me so I know you got home okay. And so you can fill me in. She winked. There isn't going to be anything to fill you in on. I'm going to say thank you to the man for helping us, then head home. Safe, but not fun. Liz blew Jill a kiss and headed off. Soon after Liz walked out the door, Mr. TDTS strode back into the bar and headed straight to her, making her pounding heartbeat race even faster. He stopped a couple of feet from her table. Even though she stood, she had to tilt her head back to look at him. Are you all right? He asked, his eyes sweeping over her. He really was checking on her, not checking her out. Thank you, she told him. You were amazing. He shrugged. Glad I could help. That joker was drunk. I doubt he'd have the nerve to do any of that while sober. Yeah, he was pretty wasted she agreed. You usually don't see that in here. He glanced around at the now tame bar, nodded, and turned to her. I'm cool. He held out his hand. Jill. Good, she remembered her own name. That was a start. She slipped her hand into his, reveling in the dry toughness of his skin and shook perhaps a moment too long. He hesitated briefly. Your friend left. Do you need to get going, or can I buy you a drink? Now it was Jill who hesitated. It wasn't likely they had anything in common. But the thought of going home alone suddenly seemed terribly depressing. Why not stay a little while and enjoy his company? 
When would she ever get another chance to flirt with a tall, sexy man who was obviously kind and charming, too? Cole grinned, and she suspected her conflicted feelings were written all over her face. She was feeling off-kilter because of what had happened with whiskey breath, and her nerves sizzled with attraction for the man standing in front of her. Might as well enjoy it as long as she could. I'd love another drink. Thanks. Cole pulled out Jill's chair, then took his own seat, motioning to a waitress for their drinks. As they waited, he asked, Are you sure you're okay? She seemed to be, and she'd handled herself fine. Even so, when the man hadn't immediately backed off, a familiar sense of protectiveness had gripped Cole. Fine. Thanks to you, he didn't touch me. Jill smiled. Natural. Pretty. The drinks arrived, and Jill asked, so you seemed comfortable confronting that jerk. Are you a cop or something? It was a perfectly reasonable question, but Cole didn't like talking about himself. Talk of his job would eventually turn to other things, maybe even his mom, and that was the last thing he wanted. He took a swig off his beer. Something. What about you? I run a daycare, she said. He raised an eyebrow. Daycare. It fit with her girl-next-door looks, and yet it didn't. As he'd noticed before, there seemed to be more to her than met the eye, something he'd confirmed when she'd gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the guy who'd bothered her. Her words had been calm and clear, yet the tilt of her chin had been defiant, and an unmistakable fire had burned in her eyes. Wait, what had they been talking about? Daycare. Kids. He couldn't imagine working with kids all day. They didn't exactly scare him, but they seemed like a lot of work. And maybe they did scare him on some level, at least when it came to the idea of having his own. What if he couldn't handle the responsibility? What if it made him feel tied down? His interests and profession didn't exactly broadcast soccer dad. And Lord knew his own birth father wasn't a ringing endorsement for parental commitment and proficiency either. The fact Cole didn't even know the man's name was proof enough. So you work with kids all day. That's brave. He almost winced at how lame he sounded, but Jill didn't seem to care. She giggled. Yeah, it can get a little scary sometimes. Are you from L.A.? Born and raised. What about you? Same. He nodded taking in all her pretty features and smooth skin. Then he realized he'd been silently staring at her and she was blushing. Catching sight of the dartboard over her shoulder, he cleared his throat. You ever throw a dart? Once or twice. Her mouth quirked as if she was keeping a secret. Then she got up and strutted over to the dartboard with a confidence that made Cole instinctively realize she'd not only thrown a dart before, but she was probably good at the game better than good. Like he'd suspected, she wasn't all sweet and sugar, but a little spice, too. Cole pushed back his chair, walked to the dartboard, and plucked the darts out one by one. He handed the three with red flags to her, keeping the blue ones for himself. Ladies first. As she took the darts, their fingers touched, and he swore she sucked in a breath. His mind went straight to imagining all the things his fingers could do to her and what she could do to him. I can show you how to throw if you want, he offered. She licked her lips, then nodded. Sure, that would, that would be great. He positioned himself behind her, wrapped one arm around her waist, and cradled her hand in his, helping her take aim. He didn't care about the dart or the game, of course, and neither did she. All you need to do is focus. Are you focused? She nodded. Are you visualizing what you want, Jill? He asked, his warm breath near her ear. Because he sure was. She nodded in response. Say it, he commanded, wanting confirmation that she was as revved up as he was. She swallowed audibly and he glanced down, watching as her chest hitched with the efforts to draw in enough air. Yes, I'm visualizing what I want. Good, he rasped. All you have to do is hit that target. Feel how much you want it and go for it. Ready? She made a small, whimpering sound and he imagined what she might be thinking. She took aim and threw. 
The first dart landed and struck just outside the bullseye. She whooped in triumph. Cole took a shaky step back. I think I just got myself taken by a shark. He laughed. Jill wiggled her eyebrows. Technically, you haven't been taken since we're not playing for anything. You saying you want to? He asked. Heat flared in her eyes as his attraction to her intensified. It must be written all over his face. Did she see it? Did she feel what he was feeling? Jill blew out her breath slowly. Maybe. Not sure. It's just, I'm not particularly adventurous, but I'm feeling like maybe, maybe I want that to change for just one night. Cole wanted to tell her she was wrong, that he saw the unrestrained wildness inside her. It wouldn't be obvious to most, but her ferocity was there, straining to be let free. She confirmed it when she stared at his mouth. All right, he said, raising an eyebrow. If you want to play with fire tonight, I'm more than ready to get burned. Chapter 2 Cole turned to the dartboard with a half smile, but Jill caught his head to toe scan of her. The music and conversations around the bar made this space near the back feel secluded, thankfully. She couldn't act this way if she felt like it was connected to her real life. No, this was some strange dream. She watched as he threw his dart. It didn't quite land as closely to the bullseye as hers, but he was no rookie. They met each other's gazes for a heated moment. He leaned close to softly say, It's not over yet. Jill lined hers up again and threw. That one hit the red bullseye dead in the center. It is now. She pumped her fist in the air, high on all the emotions raging inside her. She pulled her darts and waited on him. When he took aim, she said, We have a weekly dart tournament at the daycare. Poor kids are always broke when we're done. Cole laughed just as he threw his next dart. It landed completely outside in the black. No fair, you're making up stories to distract me. Jill threw her next dart. Not a bullseye, but still good. Me, making things up? You should see how good the kids are getting at shooting pool. Cole laughed again, and Jill felt giddy with her ability to make him unravel. A big, tough guy like him, smiling and laughing at her jokes. It filled her with a sense of power. He took aim on his next turn. I don't know if I want to win or lose, because I don't know what we're betting. Well, maybe we can think of a way to make us both winners. It just popped out of her mouth. She wanted to pat her own back for flirting like a champ, but at the same time she wanted to run screaming out the door. What was she doing taking on someone like Cole? He raised his brow before throwing the dart. This time he was way off, the dart hitting the wood paneling beside the dartboard and clattering to the floor. Whoops, he said, keeping his eyes on her and leaning a little closer. Since you're the winner, I guess it's only fair that you choose your prize, so tell me. He reached down and gently held her hand in his own giant one. What do you want, Jill? She hoped the music covered her gasp. You, she thought. Another drink, maybe? Cole asked with a wide-eyed, innocent expression. No, I think I want to. How could she tell him she wanted him? She had no experience with this. He watched her, emotions playing out in his eyes. He wished she could read them, if only she knew him better. But that was the whole point. She didn't. She just knew he was gallant, charming, and hot. Just say it, Jill. I want to leave. With you. He stared at her a full minute, making her squirm. Then he nodded like she'd just confirmed what he already knew. He reached up to cup her chin in his hand. That's easy, and that doesn't count as your prize. You keep thinking about what it is you want. In fact, why don't you think of three things you want me to give you once we walk out that door? He flashed a smile at her. She nibbled her bottom lip. So you're like a genie giving me three wishes. No, he said, reaching out and gently raking his thick fingers through her hair. 
a gesture that made her close her eyes to absorb the fluttery sensation it caused. I'm a man who wants to grant your wishes, he whispered, and is going to do whatever it takes. She gasped and leaned into him, but instead of kissing her, he released her, backed up several steps, then turned and walked to the bar. Annoyance briefly flashed through her, but oh, did he know what he was doing. The way he was drawing things out just stretched out her anticipation, made her hotter for him. She watched him pay while she hurriedly gathered her jacket and purse. Then he turned, put a gentle hand at her back, and steered her toward the exit. The door shut behind them, cutting off the music. Suddenly, they stood together in the quiet of the outdoors. Her heart beat wildly. What was she doing just leaving with a strange man like this? This was so unlike her. They faced each other, and Cole's hand slipped behind her neck, holding her gently. He lifted her chin again, but this time he brought his lips down on her mouth. The kiss was hot but sweet, sweeter than she would have expected from a mass of muscle such as him, but then again, that was what was so intoxicating about him, that blend of gentleness and hardcore, solid man. Jill felt her legs weakening. Her heart hammered in her chest and her stomach was so full of butterflies that she felt like it was about to take flight. She couldn't breathe, but she never wanted the feeling to end. She prayed she wouldn't crumble right on the sidewalk. She moaned, grabbing a handful of his shirt. But then, right as she leaned into him for a longer kiss, he pulled away gently planting a softer, more innocent kiss right on the center of her lips and another on her cheek. She was a quivering mass of girl mush. He looked her deep in the eyes. His were brown, warm, and so inviting. Last chance. You sure you want to leave with me? Are you trying to talk me out of it? No, I just want to make sure this isn't about thanking me for what happened earlier. You don't owe me anything, Jill. I was happy to help. Oh, this isn't how I thank people, Cole, she said quickly. This is about you making me feel things I haven't felt in a long time. Maybe never. Like? Wild and free. Like I can be anyone, do anything, so yes, I still want to leave with you. His eyes simmered so hotly that she instinctively looked away, afraid she'd explode into a ball of fire otherwise and her eyes caught on a shiny black and red Harley sitting behind them like a sulking bull. It seemed to whisper of danger and wild times, much like Cole. Yours? she asked. He tucked a strand of her hair behind her ear, and she noticed his hand wasn't quite steady. The idea that she was affecting this big man as much as he was affecting her was intoxicating. Good guess. I'm obviously not a sports sedan kind of guy. Well, I know you like riding bikes and rescuing girls from obnoxious drunks. What else should I know about you? He rested his big hands lightly on her waist. She liked the weight of them, the way they seemed to fit there perfectly. She needed more of that. I'm the kind of guy who likes to show, rather than tell. What are you going to show me? She asked coyly, blushing at her own bravado. All kinds of things. You'll just have to wait and see. He lowered his head and lightly kissed her neck. She grew dizzy from the sensation. And you're okay with just one night? He asked. He leaned back to await her answer. His words surprised her. She hadn't thought that far. But of course she didn't want anything else from him. Couldn't expect anything more. This was a dream. A fantasy. And the great thing about a fantasy man was that he gave you all you could stand and then conveniently disappeared, so you didn't have to deal with any icky consequences afterward. Am I really going through with this? She wondered. Yes, 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 every fiber of her being cried out. This guy makes you feel alive. He's also incredibly sweet and totally into you. You'll never get a chance like this again, so don't pass it by. He blew out an agonizing breath. I want you to know, you're amazing, but I have to be honest. I'm not interested in anything long-term right now. There's stuff going on in my life, stuff that... Jill covered his mouth with her fingertips, 
It's okay. You don't have to make excuses. I don't need that. Only Cole looked uncertain, as if he couldn't believe that a woman like her wouldn't want more from him, and he was probably right. But no matter if she wanted more afterward, she'd do the smart thing and walk away. I'm ready to make my first wish, she said. She flashed him with a quick smile. She noticed his heavy breathing. She was doing that to him. She leaned up, and this time she kissed him. He immediately took the kiss to new levels. After a few minutes of heaven, he slowly broke their kiss and pulled away. There's a hotel a few blocks from here, she said. My first wish is we leave on your bike. You like bikes, huh? Don't know. I've never ridden one before. How come? Only a few opportunities ever came, and I was always too scared. Yet you're not scared now, he raised an eyebrow. No, she breathed. Not with you. Good, because I'm going to take care of you, Jill. I promise. Cole took her hand and led her to the Harley, where he handed her the only helmet. They could get pulled over, and wouldn't that suck? But this was an excuse in being daring and carefree, so she threw caution to the wind and pulled the helmet on. He straddled the bike, started it, and patted the seat behind him. She swung a leg over the rumbling beast, got comfy, and wrapped her arms around him. Cole covered her hands with his, checking her grip, then blazed out onto the street. The velocity pulled on her while the wind whipped around her. She felt like she was on the edge of a cliff, every nerve ending on high alert. As soon as they were cruising at a comfortable speed, the pull wore off. She felt comfortably at ease, until he turned a tight corner, leaning the bike toward the pavement. Jill squealed. Her stomach rolled and rose up into her throat, and her heart hammered, but she didn't feel at risk at any point. They ripped up one street and down another, leaning on the curves while she pressed into his back. Though twilight was approaching, the sun still warmed Jill's shoulders. All around them were the thin, towering palms of L.A. At red lights, car passengers watched them. She daydreamed that Cole was her boyfriend, and this was just one ride of many they'd taken. What a rush! And over way too quickly. Right when she was having the time of her life, he slowed down and came to a stop beside the Avenue Palms Hotel. She pulled the helmet off, not bothering to muffle her laughter. I loved that! A wicked grin lit up his face. I'm glad. You have your second wish in mind? Yes, starting with more kisses, then only getting better from there. His eyes grew fiery. He gave a quick nod at the hotel entrance. I'm going to check in. I'll be right back. She nodded and used her time alone to rake out the tangles in her hair, take deep, calming breaths, and keep her courage up. Quicker than she would have thought possible, Cole was back. He escorted her through a side entrance and into a hotel elevator, then to their room. As he slid the keycard into the slot, she took another big breath and let it out slowly. The possible danger of the situation gave her a moment's pause, but then, as if sensing her fear, Cole stopped and turned to her, giving her a sweet smile. She nodded as if saying she was fine. They stepped inside. The room smelled clean, and the linens on the bed were a bright, crisp white. Thank goodness. She'd have hated to spend their time together in some dingy motel. He closed and locked the door behind her. They looked at each other for only a few seconds before he slipped his hands around her waist and pulled her to him. Still okay? Yes, I want this. Wish number two? Kiss me again. Please. He bent down to kiss her, and Jill's brain turned to absolute mush as his lips gently landed on hers. Afterward, time passed, and Jill once again grew aware of the whisper of A.C. dusting over her skin. They lay together silently at last, listening to the slow rhythm of his breathing. Jill felt herself growing sleepy. She had to go. She didn't want to, but she had to. They'd agreed to one time together. That didn't include sleeping over. When she was completely dressed, he said, That was amazing. Thank you. Jill smiled. 
I'd say let's do this another time, but... He frowned. Darling? Jill, she said. He cocked a brow. I remember. She felt her cheeks go hot. Sorry, it's just I get the feeling you call other women that and I don't want to be lumped in with them. There's no chance of that happening, he said quietly. Good, because I've loved my time with you. I don't regret a thing, Cole. Kneeling against the bed, she brought her lips to his. Please don't get up. I'm going to take a cab to my car. That's ridiculous. Let me take you. Nope. I'm good. Honest. This is what I want. Take care of yourself, Cole. Cole cupped her cheek, registered the determined look in her eyes, then reluctantly gave in. Fine, but I'm walking you out and waiting with you until you get in the cab. Cole. He pulled her back down for another kiss that quickly escalated into more. Knowing the longer she delayed leaving, the harder it was going to be for her to leave at all, she finally pulled back and sighed. Walk me out. He grinned. After one more kiss. Chapter 3 It had been several months since Cole slept through the night, but after being with Jill, he fell into a deep sleep, not waking until the sun poked through the hotel curtains and tickled his face. He awoke thinking of Jill. He'd loved the look on her face when she'd pulled off his motorcycle helmet, gleeful from the ride. She'd spread her wings and flown, despite her fears, and the exhilaration she'd experienced had somehow transferred to him, making him feel more alive than he had in a long time. Maybe it was because she'd left him feeling so good, or because he was simply inspired by her boldness. But being with Jill last night helped Cole start his day with renewed determination. Today, he would deal with his mom's things. More than once, as he showered and got ready, he found himself missing Jill. Even though he'd made it clear they'd only be together one night, he hadn't come close to getting his fill of her. They hadn't had a chance to talk nearly enough. He wanted to know more about her who she was, how much further she'd walk on the wild side if given the chance. He could always call and ask to see her again, but then he remembered. He hadn't gotten her number. Idiot, he thought. Feeling far more grumpy than he had when he woke up, he headed home. There, in the half-empty apartment, he packed enough stuff to stay at his mom's for a few days. If he left before the job was done, it might be another three months before he talked himself into going back again. The house cleaner's husband had left cardboard boxes in the garage for him, so he just needed to get in, pack, and get out. Unfortunately, his determination to get the job done waned as he rode back to his mother's house. By the time he got there, he'd almost changed his mind. Getting rid of her things would mean getting rid of her. No, it wouldn't, Cole, he told himself. His mother's memory was in his heart, not in her belongings. Once again, he sat on his bike across the street, staring at the house that had been his mother's home all his life. He had grown up, messed up, and shaped up within its walls, and his mother had been his rock the entire time. Everything about that house reminded him she was gone. The longer he stared, the deeper the hole in his heart grew. While sitting there, gathering the strength to ride his bike along the side driveway and park it in the rear garage that currently housed his mom's little hatchback, he saw a dark head poke around the corner from the back of the house. Was someone casing the place? He turned off the engine, swung off the bike, and charged across the street. He could see the body that belonged to the head now. It was just a little boy, a tiny one at that. He couldn't have been more than four or five years old. Why was some kid in his mother's yard? Cole glanced over at his mom's rental house next door. A teenaged girl with a blonde ponytail sat in the driveway, which was bordered by a gate and a white picket fence. She was surrounded by five toddlers. It looked like they were drawing on the sidewalk with an array of colored chalk. Obviously, the teen wasn't the woman his mother had told him about. Her daughter, maybe? A babysitter? Since it was Sunday, it couldn't be a daycare. Or did daycares open on the weekend these days? 
Last night, Jill said she ran a daycare. Adventurous Jill with hair like dark brown mink and beautiful green eyes. Jill, who'd put a smile on his face. Multiple times. Stop thinking about her, Cole. What's done is done. They'd agreed to one night. He needed focus on the here and now. The kid in his backyard had obviously strayed off from the group next door. Cole walked along the side of the house and waited for the boy to peek around the corner again. After a moment or two, the boy's face popped around the side of the house. You're trespassing on private property, Cole said, his voice sterner than he'd meant it to be. The little boy froze and stared up at Cole, unsure if he should surrender or run. Stanley Baker, where are you? Come back here, please. The voice, tinged with mild panic, obviously belonged to the teen girl watching the kids next door. Stanley Baker ran off, giving Cole a wide, mischievous grin, as though saying, You can't catch me. Cole smiled in spite of himself. He kept an eye on Stanley until he rejoined the group next door. Only then did Cole head back to his bike and drive it to the rear of the house, to his mom's garage. The garage door opener was in his bag, but he decided to keep his bike parked outside for now. He grabbed his duffel, slung it over his shoulder, and unlocked the front door. After taking a deep breath, he stepped into his past. He stood there, staring at the threshold for a long time. The house didn't smell the same anymore. When Mom was alive, there was always the aroma of fresh flowers or something baking in the oven. Now it smelled musty. Empty. Hi, Mom, I'm home. Cole dropped his bag and closed the door behind him, trying his best to hold it together. The front door opened into the living room. He walked over to the big glass hutch that covered one whole wall. It was filled with antique teapots, dishes, snow globes, and figurines. His mom had loved antiques, and there'd been many Saturday mornings when Cole was a boy that she would wake him up early and drag him out to a swap meet or yard sale. She never visited antique stores or bought her things directly because she loved the hunt. Some days, they'd go to ten yard sales and come home empty-handed. Other days, they'd go to just one, and his mom would find herself another treasure to proudly display in the giant hutch that Cole's grandfather built for her before he passed away. Cole opened the hutch and took out one of the teacups. His big hands could hardly grasp the dainty handle and quickly put it down, worried he was going to crush it. What was he going to do with all this stuff? It wasn't like he was going to put it on display in his apartment. But each delicate teacup reminded him of his mother, so he couldn't imagine throwing them away either. He decided right then that he'd pack everything up, putting into storage the things that had been most precious to him and his mom, then donating the rest. He left the living room and ambled down the hall to his old bedroom. He smiled when he pushed open the door. Cole had been living on his own since he was 18 years old, but his room still looked exactly the way he'd left it the last time he'd spent the night there. He entered and sat down on the bed, feeling like his heart was being ripped from his chest. Despite raising a child on her own, his mother had made sure he had everything he ever needed and most of what he wanted. Over at the shelves above his old desk, he picked up a faded photo of him in a football uniform. Go Mavericks! He thought back to the first time he'd put on that gold and green uniform. He was so proud back then, his mother so nervous about injuries. Cole grew into his full height later in life, along with his bulk, but only after hours spent sweating at the gym. At 13 years old, though, he was six inches shorter and ten pounds lighter than most of his peers. The coach benched him the entire first game. That evening, after Cole and his mother got home from the game, his mother saw how upset he was. Putting aside her own fears about him playing football with boys so much bigger, she sat down at the kitchen table and used a crayon and napkin to give him a crash course in Football 101. A cheerleader back in her day, his mom had once been in love with the captain of her school's football team. Apparently, she'd paid a lot of attention to the game. 
After giving him a lesson, she told him that when the game started the following Saturday, he should stand next to the coach on the sidelines and be the squeaky wheel. Of course you need to know what you're doing, but the best way to learn is by getting out there and getting some experience, right? Every time he even looks like he's going to put someone in, remind him you're there and ready, she told him. Cole had taken her advice. At the next practice, he impressed the offensive coach with how much better he understood the game. And at the game that Saturday, Cole followed the head coach up and down the up and down the sidelines like a little shadow, telling him he was ready. The coach finally put him in just to shut him up. Cole played like a champ that night, and from then on, he was never benched again. Now, Cole put the photograph back on the shelf. He took a deep breath. He was going to have to just do this. He was heading into the garage to grab some boxes when the doorbell rang. Frowning, he headed to the front door. He opened it, ready to ward off a misguided solicitor. Instead, he took in a swift breath when he saw her. Shock rattled through him. Jill? She stood on his mother's front porch, her face in profile so she hadn't noticed him yet. She wore a purple shirt and jeans that were spotted with chalk, paint, and what looked like flour. Didn't matter, she looked beautiful. Memories of the way her hair had smelled barreled down on him. What was she doing here? At the sound of the door opening, Jill turned her head. She felt the blood drain from her face. Just as quickly, a deep blush heated it back up. She stared at her tattooed biker from the night before, hardly able to believe her eyes. What was he doing in Stella's house? Oh, she thought, now I've gone and done it. He's a stalker. But could he be considered a stalker given she'd shown up at his door? Yes, she decided, if he'd been watching her, waiting for her. No, there had to be a perfectly reasonable explanation for him being here. It had been a few months since Stella died, and Jill still felt horrible that she'd been out of state on a rare vacation for a cousin's wedding when it had happened. She hadn't even made it back for the funeral. Today was the first time someone had come into the house since then. She wanted to make sure everything was okay. She sure hadn't expected to see Cole open the door. Was he a repairman, contracted to fix up the house before a sale? Slowly, it dawned on her that Cole still stood there, one hand on the door jamb, puzzlement etched across his face. Realizing he was waiting for her to speak, she sucked in a deep breath and steadied her nerves. Um, what are you doing here? she asked, measuring her voice to keep it even. He didn't exactly look pleased to see her. In fact, he looked wary, like maybe he was thinking she was the stalker. You came to my door, he said. What are you doing here? He did think she was the crazy one. I live next door, she said quickly, wondering how everything had gone wrong so quickly. Or, did you know that already? Cole looked confused. No, I know that. This is my mom's house. His mother? You're Stella's son? Colton. The one she tried to set me up with. Colton. Cole. Shock radiated throughout her system. The man she'd met last night was the very man Stella had said would be perfect for Jill. Jill had always politely declined Stella's invitations to meet the woman's son. She wasn't at a point in her life where she wanted to be in any kind of relationship. In truth, maybe she never would be. Not because she didn't want a partner to share her life with, but because she didn't want to saddle said partner with the burden of being with a woman who had a 50% chance of inheriting her father's early-onset Alzheimer's. Cole's gaze caught hers, and suddenly the fire that had been banked there flared back to life. Heat replaced the cold shock. Since she'd never actually seen a photo of Stella's son, because she'd shot the idea of dating him down from the get-go, she hadn't exactly known what a good thing she was passing up at the time. Wow. But how to handle this situation now? I, uh, she stumbled. I didn't realize last night that, uh, wait, so you knew my mom? 
Pain flickered in his eyes, then he closed them and raked a hand through his hair. In that moment, despite his stature, tattoos, and bulging muscles, the last thing he resembled was a tough guy. He looked... lost. Instinctively, she reached out to touch him, her hand freezing then dropping when he abruptly opened his eyes and took a step back. You're the tenant from next door. Of course. He laughed as if he was in on some private joke. The sound was more bitter than humorous. My mom talked about you. She liked you. A lot. I liked her too. I'm so sorry for your loss. Jill felt tears sting her eyes and looked away, blinking. Stella was such a sweet lady. More than sweet. Despite her illness, Stella had been strong and there for her in so many ways. And she'd shared that strength with Jill at a time when she really needed it. They'd met when they'd both been undergoing chemo. It wasn't nearly as serious for Jill. She had a small lump removed, and the doctor, when he'd recommended chemo to completely kill any missed cancerous cells, reassured her that they'd caught things early and she should be fine. But it had still been a scary time for her, something Stella understood perfectly. She'd done her best to distract Jill, talking about her amazing son, then going so far as to rent Jill the house next door, since Jill said she needed a bigger place to start the daycare. She glanced back at Cole. Her heart ached for him. From everything Stella had told her, they'd been very close. Stella had mentioned more than once how guilty she'd felt that Cole had clipped his wings and given up his dreams of traveling the globe after she'd been diagnosed with cancer. He'd refused to be too far from her. Now things were different, but before he started living his life, he obviously had to deal with the fact that his mother was no longer going to be a part of it. Anyway, Jill wrung her hands. I, um, came by to apologize about Stanley, the little boy, for disturbing you earlier. It won't happen again. I've spoken to the teacher's aide, and, uh, I admit I was curious to see who was here. Ah, uh, not a problem. I liked Stanley. He smiled. So you run the daycare next door? He leaned against the door jamb, still studying her, but he didn't invite her in. You remembered I own a daycare. He looked at her strangely. Of course, I remember everything about last night. Her eyes fell as she contemplated her nails. Standing there, she could smell the scent of his skin, his cologne or deodorant or whatever it was. Images from last night flitted through her mind, and she could only hope he wasn't doing the same thing. That woman last night, that wasn't her. She'd let loose for one night and one night only, thinking no one would ever know. This was just awkward. She snuck another glance at him, but his gaze caught hers. For a second, it took her back to that first look, that moment of instant connection in the bar. I don't know how to handle this, how to reconcile this man being here, invading my regular life. Cole reached over and gently ran his thumb down her jaw. Jill closed her eyes. What don't you know? She swallowed hard and gently pulled her chin away. For a second, his hand hung in the air as if he didn't know what to do with it. Then he pushed both hands into his jean pockets. We have a college intern working with us. I'll make sure you're not bothered again. Jill, you weren't bothering me. Stanley wasn't bothering me either. Do you want to come in? The abrupt invitation threw her. Was he thinking they could... But no, he looked sad, lonely. He probably just wanted some company to distract himself from the pain of being inside his mother's home. And she could give him that. For a few minutes, at least. When she'd left the daycare five minutes ago, Liz and Monica had just started an art project with the kids. Still, she hesitated. This huge, gorgeous man was the little boy that Stella used to talk about all the time. She should decline his invitation to come inside. This was supposed to have been a one-night thing, and while that was complicated by the fact Cole was Stella's son, and her new, and who knew for how long, neighbor, she shouldn't complicate it any further. Which is why it made no sense when she smiled and said, Sure, then stepped through the door. Chapter 4 
Cole's heart thumped loudly in his chest as he closed the door and faced Jill. God, he wanted her. But now wasn't the time to get horizontal, he reminded himself. Everything had changed the moment he'd opened the door and he still felt off balance. And from the way Jill's expressions flitted from one to another to another, she was just as discombobulated as he. He leaned back against the door, wanting to say something, anything, to put her at ease when it was clear she wasn't. But he floundered, again filled with the conflicting urges to run to her, but also push her away, just like he'd been when he'd first spotted her in that bar. She crossed her arms protectively against her chest and glanced around the house. Jill, Cole, she said at the same time. A nervous giggle bubbled up from her throat. This is crazy. I don't even know what to say. We weren't supposed to see each other again. I mean... This is awkward, right? Awkward, sure, that's one way to describe it. He straightened and tried for a grin but rubbed his neck instead. Follow me. He led her through the living room to the kitchen. Once there, she sat on a wooden stool. He leaned on his elbows over the counter. Is seeing me so awful? He said, attempting a joke. You saw a lot more of me last night. For a moment, a smile flashed across her face and her cheeks went delightfully pink. No, of course it's not awful. Then the smile faded and the color lost its bloom. A shadow crossed her eyes. Well, the circumstances are awful because of why you're here. I mean, I assume you're here to go through your dead mother's things. The unspoken words hung in the air. He tensed again. I'm sorry, she said. I can tell this is hard for you, and I'm only making it worse. It's okay, Cole said, and he meant it. While thinking about his mother did upset him, things seemed just a little better with Jill here. Don't worry about it. He ran his hand through his hair. Would you like a drink? He'd offered her a drink last night, too, and look what that had led to. She blushed as if having the same thought, ducking her head. I meant water, but maybe there's still some soda left in the pantry. A quick smile flashed across her face and she looked back up at him. Oh, no, thank you. I should probably get back. My business partner, Liz, she was with me last night at the bar. She's with the kids, but I'm on duty until 5.30. All right. Are most daycares open on Sunday? No, ours is a little different. How so? Some of the parents we cater to have special needs. They work on the weekends or need odd times off because they're going through a difficult time. What kind of difficult time? Um, we cater to families who are going through an illness of some sort. Like with cancer? The words came out of his mouth before he could think. Why had he gone there? A slight wince formed around her mouth, but she said softly, Sometimes. Illness doesn't maintain a nine-to-five schedule. We aren't open seven days a week, obviously, but we try to be as flexible as we can. That's really great. I'm sure it helps, he said, wondering what he'd said to make her uncomfortable. Is that how you met my mom? Did she know someone who was sick and in need of childcare? She hesitated a moment. She didn't introduce me to anyone, I just needed a place to run the daycare, and it can be difficult to rent and do all that, especially in a residential area. Insurance and county restrictions, things like that. But Stella was open to helping. She was wonderful. In mentioning his mom's name, her expression had lightened. She hadn't exactly answered his question, but he saw no reason to give her the third degree about it. Well... I'm glad you had a chance to know her. Me too. It was great seeing you again, Cole. He stifled the urge to ask her to stay or to come back later. That wouldn't be fair to her. What he'd told her last night had been the truth. He had too much going on, too many problems to offer anything to a woman. Besides, he was a protector. It was more than his job. It was his persona. She was attracted to the guy in the bar who'd stepped up when she needed help, not a simpering guy who missed his mother and wanted to cry every time he thought about never seeing her again. Anyway, Jill said, getting up from the stool. Anyway, 
He followed her back to the front door, then opened it for her. Thanks for coming in. He tensed when Jill placed her hand on his arm. He stared at her hand for a moment, then into her pale green eyes. Before he knew what was happening, Jill stepped closer and threw her arms around him. Instinctively, he returned the hug, pulling her close. In that simple embrace, his worries ebbed away, his pulse rose, and his breathing sped up to keep up the pace. He smelled the sweet shampoo in her hair, which somehow eased some of the tension inside him. And then, just like that, Jill pulled away. Your mom talked about you all the time, Cole. She couldn't have been prouder of you. Yeah. He was glad to hear his mother had spoken well of him. He really was. But right now his mother wasn't on his mind. The breeze outside shifted and Jill's scent once again filled his nostrils. Do you want to come by later? Tell me all the awesome things she told you about me. He blurted out, teasing. What happened to not getting involved, Cole? He knew he should have just let her walk away, but he couldn't. I... I'm not sure that's a good idea, Jill said, looking down at her fidgety hands, then up at him again. Last night, the woman you met, she wasn't me. Not the true me. You and I made a pact, so we should keep it that way. You're great, Cole. You really are. And I'm sorry for your loss, but this thing between us wasn't supposed to be more than a blip in time. Besides, I assume you're not moving here for good. I'm only here for a few days to pack up my mom's things. Then I'm moving to Northern California. Relief and sadness flickered across her face. Right, so given our chemistry, it's probably best if we stay away from each other, don't you think? She gave him a hopeful smile. He hesitated briefly before nodding. Sure. He forced himself to smile broadly. It's great chemistry, though. Yes, well, take care of yourself, Cole. She gave him one last lingering look. You too, Jill, he said softly as she turned and walked out of his life. Jill forced herself to stay focused. Look forward, even after he closes the door. She made her way across the lawn between the two houses. She looked down the quiet street and thought about how much she liked it here. This place, a comfortable neighborhood in suburbia, was the kind of place that people like Jill were made for. She couldn't imagine Cole watering the lawn or riding his bike around the neighborhood. Yet, oddly enough, once the shock of seeing him had worn off, it seemed strangely natural to watch him moving around inside Stella's house. Natural, though by no means insignificant. She realized she was shaking inside. Last night, he'd warned her he had stuff going on in his life, and he'd obviously told her the truth. Just like he was obviously still grieving for his mother. Now that Stella was gone, even though the rent checks were collected by a property management company, was Cole her new landlord? Would their rental agreement change? It would suck if she had to move, but she could manage if she needed to. The last thing she wanted was for him to feel any guilt about kicking her out if that's what he'd been planning to do. When Jill got back to the daycare, Liz and the kids were sitting on the carpet having story time. Monica was getting ready to leave, and Jill took the opportunity to again remind her she needed to keep a closer eye on the kids, especially Stanley. Monica apologized and promised she would. Thanks again for coming in on a Sunday, Jill said as she walked Monica to the door. Enjoy the next week off. Are you and Trevor still taking that trip to San Diego? Trevor was Monica's boyfriend, and although Monica had talked of him constantly when they'd first begun dating, she seemed more reluctant to do so now. Jill suspected it was because they were having problems. She wasn't surprised. Monica was a dedicated student with a perpetually chipper attitude. Jill had only met Trevor once, but he'd been sullen to the point of being rude, and as far as she knew, he didn't have a job or any plans to continue his education. Monica smiled. Yes, we're heading down to San Diego tomorrow. Thanks again for the time off. Of course, sweetie. See you when you get back. Jill closed the door behind Monica. While Liz read, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie, Jill picked up toys and wiped down tables, but her mind remained on Cole. 
Stella used to talk about her sweet, beautiful boy all the time. She never mentioned he was over six feet tall and built like a Mack truck, or that he had eyes that could melt a woman on the spot. Okay, so that would have been weird if she had said that, but still. Stella had talked about how much he loved oatmeal cookies, board games, and Harry Potter books. But that was when he was younger. Now that Cole looked like a hot extra from the Sons of Anarchy set, she couldn't help but smile. She pictured him with his tattoo sleeves and muscular physique playing Scrabble or reading The Prisoner of Azkaban. Last night, he'd been larger than life. Today, he was just a man who'd suffered a great loss. That unnerved her. It made her want to turn around, march back over there, and take Cole in her arms, with no other purpose than to comfort him. She had to remind herself more than once she'd turned down his invitation to go back over there for a reason. For several reasons, actually. One, given the strong pull she already felt toward Cole, it stood to reason the more time she spent with him, the harder it would be for her when he left. And second, even if Cole stuck around for a while, and they somehow ended up exploring a possible relationship— what was the point? He'd already spent most of his life sacrificing his dreams for someone he loved. He didn't need the kind of burdens that getting involved long-term with Jill might entail. Honestly, no man did. But especially not a man as vibrant as Cole. Miss Jill! One of the children brought her out of her reverie. Story time was over and Liz was getting a craft project out for later. Yes, Anaya? The little brunette tugged at her hand. Who is the man next door? The question surprised Jill. Anaya wasn't one of her more curious children. Before she could say anything, Stanley said, He's an evil giant. He was sent here from his land to spy on us. He eats kids. Stanley, Jill said, trying not to smile. She supposed that to someone who wasn't quite four feet tall yet, Cole might look like a giant. First of all, it's not nice to try and frighten your friends. And second of all, we don't say mean things about people before we get to know them. It's not nice. He seemed grumpy to me, Stanley pouted. Jill saw Liz out of the corner of her eye, holding back a chuckle, but she wouldn't look at her. If she did, she would surely laugh. Besides, she had no idea what to tell Liz about her adventures with Stanley's giant. So far, she'd managed to dodge Liz's questions about what had happened after she'd left the bar last night, saying only that she and Cole had talked before she'd headed home. But Liz had given her that look that only a best friend can, like she knew Jill was withholding information. Jill wasn't ready to talk about her night with Cole. Maybe she'd never be. But she couldn't keep to herself the fact that Cole was Stella's son and was currently visiting the house next door. She'd have to tell Liz, but only when they had some privacy. She crouched in front of Stanley. Sometimes when you're having a bad day, you seem grumpy too, right? You wouldn't want us to think that was how you were all the time, based only on one day, would you? Stanley's eyes fell to the carpet. No, Miss Jill. Good. Now I'll tell you what we're going to do before playtime. We're going to go around the circle and say one thing that we like about each one of our friends. Do you all know what that means? They mumbled and nodded, and a couple of the smaller kids continued to stare at her, having no clue what she was talking about. Stanley, you go first. Stanley made a grumpy face, but he seldom defied Jill. He stood up and said, I like Michael's blonde hair. I like Anaya's purple dress. I like Adam's brown skin, and I like Chloe's red hair bow, and I like the giant's motorcycle. Jill smiled at the boy. Much better. They all took their turns, and when the last one finished, Jill told them they could get out their toys before they started on the craft project. Controlled havoc ensued, and thoughts of Cole finally seeped from her mind. At one point, though, she thought she sensed movement outside the living room window, but when she went over, no one was outside. Could it have been Cole? She hoped so, because the thought of a stranger loitering around the daycare worried her, made her all the more determined to get an upgraded security system for the house. 
as the hours passed the children's parents came one at a time to pick them up and take them home eventually only stanley was left he lived with his dad a single father in his late thirties whose ex-wife had died several years ago jill had been impressed with jason baker a hard-working man who seemed to adore his son lately however he'd begun to make her uncomfortable there was nothing specific she could put her finger on, and it actually made her feel a little guilty, especially given how wonderful Stanley was. Stanley sat on the floor playing with some blocks when Liz slipped her arm through Jill's and whispered, I know we can't talk about it in front of our little one here, but I'm going to call you later so we can dish about the giant next door. She winked. Right after you come clean about how long you and that guy from last night talked. Jill tried to hide her smile. There's nothing to talk about. Jill shot her an, oh, please, look, and Jill bit her lip. Okay, she said softly so Stanley couldn't hear. There's nothing to talk about other than the huge coincidence that the giant is the same guy who helped us out at the bar last night, Stella's son and probably our new landlord. What? Liz squeaked. That's a coincidence. Jill warned with a raised eyebrow. You mean lucky coincidence. Holy moly, Liz fanned herself. Well, I have a feeling if there isn't a story to tell now, there soon will be. She elbowed Jill. Jill glanced toward Stella's house, feeling rattled as if Cole could hear them. It's not like that. He's grieving for his mother. Then it's too bad he's grieving all alone, Liz whispered. Before Jill could answer, she added, Do you mind if I take off a few minutes early? Not at all, Jill told her. I'll bake a batch of cookies with Stanley while we wait for his dad. Five minutes later, Jill and Stanley went into the kitchen and mixed flour, eggs, sugar, vanilla, oatmeal, and spices, then indulged in the heavenly scent of baking cookies until Stanley's father finally got there close to six. After packaging up a dozen cookies for Stanley and his dad, and then sending the little boy on his way home, Jill went back inside. She walked into her bedroom and caught sight of herself in the floor-length mirror. Oh, no! She had chalk and paint all over her clothes. Normally she didn't care. After all, it came with daycare territory. But she'd gone next door like this? She showered, and instead of putting on sweats or PJs like she normally would for an evening in, she threw on a fitted top and jeans, then dabbed on some perfume behind her earlobes. After she dried her hair and put on just a little bit of makeup, she studied herself in the mirror again. She hadn't been planning on going next door. She honestly hadn't. In fact, she'd planned to steer clear of coal. That's what they'd agreed to, after all. No more interaction. But now, all she could think about was what Liz had said, that Cole shouldn't have to grieve alone. About how she wanted to take Cole in her arms and kiss away his pain. And about all the ways, now that she was bathed and clean, Cole could mess her up again. Chapter 5 Cole was digging through his mother's cabinets, looking for something to eat that hadn't gone bad, when there was a knock on the front door. Jill? They'd agreed not to connect any more, but he couldn't help hoping it was her. He focused on not rushing to the door and took his time to open it, then regretted taking any time at all. Sans paint and chalk, looking fresh and beautiful, Jill stood there, holding a plate, the sweet scent of baked goods floating in the air along with a light floral perfume. She was gorgeous, her dark hair shiny and light eyes filled with both hesitation and determination. Hi again, she said a little too brightly. Covering up nerves, maybe? I know I said we shouldn't and that we weren't, but you see, I'm just next door and we made cookies earlier today with the kids. I thought you might like some. She pushed the plate toward him. How appropriate, enticing him with her cookies. Evil woman, he chuckled to himself. He didn't even look at the tasty treats, though. Jill seemed to be the only thing he was capable of thinking about when he wasn't thinking about his mother. Against his better judgment, Cole stepped back and motioned her in. I was just thinking I could use some food. Her eyes brightened, 
Well, you're in luck. I make the best oatmeal cookies in the world. Cole smiled. Cute she was. There was no doubt of that. However, he doubted she made oatmeal cookies better than his mom, because no one, in all his twenty-nine years, had even come close to dethroning his mother's baking. I'll take those, he said, accepting the plate and setting it on the already cluttered coffee table. Have a seat. The house is pretty empty, but I have warm wine. Jill laughed and sat down. I'm good, thanks. Save your warm wine for a special occasion. Sit with me, she said, patting the spot next to her on the sofa. Cole thought about it a moment. Only a few hours ago she'd told him they should keep their distance, yet here she was, sitting comfortably in his mother's house, wearing perfume and a smile. Was she playing games? He didn't think so. In fact, he got the feeling her change of heart was more about her own conflicting feelings. She wanted to stay away, but she was just as attracted to him as he was to her. At least that was the scenario he wanted to believe. However, there was another option, that since Jill now knew he'd lost his mother, she was just being nice. Empathy he understood and could respect. Pity he did not need nor want, however. He blew out a harsh breath and joined her on the sofa. Jill lifted the plate toward him. Are you going to try one? He took a cookie and bit into it. He closed his eyes, tasting the cinnamon, nutmeg, and allspice. These are amazing. Wow, I have to admit when you said you made the best oatmeal cookies in the world, my first thought was that there was no way they would be better than the ones my mom used to make. Jill flashed him a smile. Well, I did cheat. Your mother gave me the recipe. She did? Jill nodded, ducking her head. She used to make them and bring them over for the kiddos. They loved them. Towards the end? I mean, when she started. Anyways, she gave me the recipe so I could keep making them for the kids. She bit her lip. I did it again. I'm sorry. No, no, don't be sorry. My mom loved kids. I'm sure it was fun for her having you guys next door. Yes, she liked to sit on the porch and watch them play. Just like she'd do when Cole was a kid. He stood. You want some water? Sure, water would be great, she said. Cole went into the kitchen and poured two glasses of ice water. He drank half his glass before heading back into the living room. Here you go. He sat down next to Jill again. So what part of L.A. are you from? I grew up in Orange County. Oh, an O.C. girl. Is Daddy a doctor? A strange look crossed Jill's face. She seemed to recover quickly before she said, No, he was an artist. Was? Yes, he passed a few years ago. Cole craned his neck to catch her downcast gaze. Now I'm the one who's sorry. She shrugged. It's okay. He could tell it wasn't, but she didn't seem any more interested in talking about her father than Cole was in talking about his mom. So he let it go. So what do you do, Cole? Jill folded her hands in her lap. She'd entered into the banal, let's get to know each other type of discussion. Definitely different from the Jill he'd known last night. Was that woman really so different from the Jill who sat sedate and prim on his couch? Didn't matter, really. He'd let her set the pace in whatever this now was between them. Friendship? Neighbors? His mind was all for the new dynamic, I'm self-employed, I co-own a security company. Security, like for weddings and parties, things like that? He fought to keep from brushing his fingers through her hair, indulging himself in the silken strands. No, more like for rich famous people, rock stars, movie stars, politicians. Wow, seriously? Who's the most famous person you ever did security for? I can't tell you her name. It's all confidential. He looked around dramatically like he was making sure no one was listening, then said in a conspiratorial tone, What I can tell you is she's pretty famous for two things. My partner and I had to charge her double for protecting it. I mean, them, if you know what I mean. Jill laughed. The sound loosened Cole's muscles. Focus, Cole, he told himself. 
Relax. Enjoy the company of a woman for who she is, not how she makes you feel. He took another cookie and bit into it. What made you want to go into the security business? She asked. He shrugged. We live in L.A. It's a hotbed of celebrities and big shots, right? A friend who I've known forever agreed it could probably turn into a lucrative business, and it has. In fact, business is so good we're going to open an office in San Francisco. Oh, that's right. You mentioned moving north earlier. That's the plan, at least until the business is established. She nodded and sipped her water. Cole watched her face. Was he imagining things, or did it seem to bother her that he'd be leaving L.A.? They barely knew each other, so that didn't make sense. Neither did his own reaction to the idea he might not see her again. So why was he? Pretending he didn't want to see her again, when all he wanted was to take her in his arms. Maybe there was a reason she was here. Maybe they were supposed to have more than one night together. His attraction to her overrode coherent thought. He reached out and touched her face. For a few moments, she stared at him, her eyes darkening. Cole, she whispered, her voice unsteady. He said nothing, just closed the space between them and covered her mouth with his. He put his hands on either side of her face. Their lips brushed back and forth lightly in a whisper-soft kiss. He slid his hand down the side of her face to her neck, then over her shoulder and down her arm. He felt goosebumps rising on her silky skin. Wait, stop. She breathlessly pushed him back. Cole was breathless, too. Breathless and confused. Why had she stopped him? I can't do this. She shot to her feet. Cole stood up, too. Okay, that's okay. Can I ask why? I just can't. I'm sorry. I'm really attracted to you, Cole. Obviously. But you're going through so much right now. If I had known that last night, I never would have... You never would have what? Taken advantage of me? Because I have to tell you, I wouldn't mind you taking advantage of me again. We're neighbors now, she said. Not for long. That's right. You're going to pack everything up and move to San Francisco. Are you going to sell the house I'm living in, too? Her eyes brimmed with worry. The abrupt turn in the conversation threw Cole. He couldn't believe he hadn't considered how selling the rental house would affect her. But he was planning on selling the house, both houses, and investing the money into the expansion of Frontline. That meant Jill would have to find some place else to run her daycare. An unwelcome suspicion swept through him. Again, he considered her change of heart by coming over. Was the possibility he was going to sell the house the real reason she was here? Had she come over to try and talk him out of selling? The idea that she'd been motivated by her own agenda rather than any genuine desire to be with him made him flinch and say incredibly stupid things. Why do you want to know, Jill? Are you hoping to change my mind? Because it would take more than cookies for that, or is that why you kissed me back? Her eyes widened. Her face paled. Her expression... She looked like he'd just smacked her in the face. Did you seriously just say that to me? Yeah, he had. Because he was an idiot. I'm sorry, that was a crappy thing to think, much less say. You're right, it was, she said stiffly before standing. Goodbye, Cole. Wait. Jill, please, I didn't mean that. But she wasn't buying it. She opened the door and stepped out. She paused on the front stoop to turn and face him. Before last night, I'd never... And what you just accused me of, I'd never... She shook her head. That's not who I am, but how would you know that? You don't even know me, and I don't really know you, do I? That's not true. Come back inside so we can talk. No, I don't want to. Right now, I'm thinking I don't ever want to see you again, Cole. With that, she was gone. And this time, he was pretty sure she wasn't coming back. Chapter 6 The next day, after a restless sleep in his old room and a brutal morning workout at a nearby gym, Cole still burned with guilt over what he'd said to Jill the night before. He was a fool for jumping to conclusions and letting unfounded suspicions make him lose control of his mouth. 
More than once last night, he'd barely managed to stop himself from going over to her house. Today he'd go over and apologize, though he'd wait until her workday was over before bothering her. Dropping his gym bag in the hall, he got straight to work, packing up everything in the living room except his mother's knickknacks. After filling several boxes with stuff, he took down framed photos and paintings from the walls, things that had become so familiar to him he'd barely noticed them anymore. Now that he had packed most of it up, the space seemed overly large and empty, like a shell more than a house. Still avoiding the collectibles in the hutch, he started in on his mom's bedroom. His gaze immediately landed on the old trunk at the end of the bed. Whenever he'd brought home his artwork or his report cards from school, she would hang them on the refrigerator to show them off for a while, and then when she took them down to make room for something else, she would take them into her room and put them in the chest. He trudged over and sat on the floor next to it, then pulled the lid open. The brown chest was packed with clear shoe boxes, spiral notebooks, file folders, and little bags filled with stuff. A lifetime of memories. Abruptly, not allowing himself to examine any one thing too closely, he began moving items into a packing box. He paused when he spotted what looked like an announcement for his mom's senior prom, and his hands shook a bit. The announcement, along with several other pieces of paper, fell from his hands and fluttered to the floor. He picked up the item closest to him, a newspaper clipping attached to a postcard. The clipping was from 1985, news coverage of a junior Republican convention in Long Beach. He stiffened. The last thing his mother told him before he informed her he didn't want to know anything about his father was she'd met him at a political rally. Was this the one? He hadn't wanted to know. But his mom was gone now, so he could change his mind, if he wanted to. No. Cole wanted nothing to do with the man who'd abandoned the woman who'd given birth to his child. The man who'd abandoned his own child. He threw the clipping into the box, then charged into the living room to grab his keys. The familiar need to be outside and to feel the wind pelting his face, the desire to be truly free, ate at him. Heading out the door, he made his way to the rear garage, pausing a moment to glance at Jill's house before grabbing his bike and getting on the road. He just needed a diversion before he lost his mind. He drove south for some time before he took the exit for liquid cooled. As he pulled into the parking lot filled with Harleys, he blew a sigh of relief. At least some things never changed. The liquid cooled sign still had a burned out E and D. The building's ugly brown paint had been touched up recently, but the new paint had just been slathered on top of the old, so in some spots it was lumpy or peeling right off. He made his way through the sea of hogs to the front door. There, he heard the refrain from Witchy Woman floating from the jukebox out to the parking lot. Witchy Woman indeed, he thought. The heavy wooden door groaned on its hinges when he pulled it open. He immediately spotted several familiar faces and the tightness eased from his chest. The best thing about Liquid Cooled was how it was off the beaten path. Ninety-five percent of its clientele were true bikers, men and women alike. Most rode every day and would die with their hands on the bars or gravel in their back. Some had become too arthritic to ride, so instead they sat around and talked about the good old days when they could the places they'd visited, the accidents they'd been in, and how they lived to tell about it. The last 5% were usually women who simply loved bikers. In the dim lighting, worn, black vinyl stools lined the bar. Cole took the empty stool at the end and ordered a beer. The leather-faced man next to him was arguing with the guy on his other side about whether Harley changed their engines to 700cc in 76 or 77. Well, look who finally dragged himself back here. Cole grinned and slowly turned around to face a 300-pound, bald hunk of flesh sporting a salt-and-pepper beard down to his chest and a three-inch scar gracing his right cheek down to his neck, disappearing under his t-shirt. How are you, Cole? I'm doing all right, Smash. 
Where have you been? We were just talking about you the other day, weren't we, Stitch? Smash called. An old guy sitting at a table across the room looked up, grinned, and joined them. Well, well, there's that pretty boy. Stitch was about five foot seven, but he was pushing eighty, so they all let him think he was seven feet tall if he wanted to. How are you, Stitch? Breathing, he said, his standard reply. Mm. Cole took a long swallow of his beer. He stared at it even as he felt the other men's gazes on him. What you been up to? Smash gripped Cole's shoulder in a death grip, then slapped him on the back so hard he almost spit out his beer. Up to no good, Cole drawled out. Would you have it any other way? Nah, but maybe you can be up to no good with us sometime. How about the ride home? Cole had no idea what he was talking about, and apparently his cluelessness showed on his face, because Smash pulled another guy in as he passed. Viper, tell this pretty boy about the ride home. Viper realized the pretty boy was Cole and perked up. Hey, what's up, man? Same old, Cole muttered. What's this ride home Smash is babbling about? It's a cross-country trek from Glendale to Milwaukee, Viper said. I did it back in 08. It was a good time. Sounds like it, Cole said. When is this happening? We leave in a couple of months. You have to go with us, man. We stop and see all the major attractions along the way, plus all the Harley dealerships, too. Party every night, but mostly we just ride. It's indescribable, Viper said, getting a glazed look in his eye. Why is it called the ride home? We end up in Milwaukee, right where the first Harley was created. It's a pilgrimage, my friend. Started back in 08 for their 105th birthday, but now we just do it every year because we can. Sounds great, Cole said, thinking it honestly did. Too bad he couldn't join them. But I can't go. Why not? Smash asked, leaning into him. You got an old lady we don't know about pulling the strings? Is that why we ain't seen you around here for so long? Cole thought about Jill, then instantly slammed the door shut on the image of her in his mind. Now someone mentions an old lady and she's the first one his mind goes to? No, but I have the new office to get set up in San Fran as soon as possible. Smash flapped his thumb and fingers together. Yak, yak, yak. We all got jobs and stuff to do, man. You can't just work all the time. Suddenly, Cole remembered what Luke had said about having fun, taking time off, getting back to himself. He'd always wanted to travel more. His mother had encouraged him to do so while he was still young enough to enjoy it. Although he'd snuck in numerous adventures over the years, he'd never felt comfortable being gone for long and he'd never done such a long trip on his bike. He had to admit, a road trip with the guys sounded better and better the more he thought about it. Maybe taking a break between selling his mom's house and opening the business in San Fran might just be what he needed. You're right, Smash. Tell you what, I'll give it some serious thought and call you next week. Fair enough, the big biker said. Now buy me a drink, will ya? He ordered up two more beers, and they shared them while the jukebox played two more songs. After a while, Smash asked, So how are things going since you lost your ma? Cole finished off his second beer. He could laugh and joke with Smash all day, or talk about riding Harleys, but talking about something as serious as his mom and getting her things in order was a little different. He shook his head when the bartender asked if he wanted another beer. Just water he said, then turned back to Smash. I'm doing okay most of the time, but other times. Yeah, I'll bet. It's been a while since I lost mine, but I remember her like it was yesterday. Buried the old man a few years back, too. Your old man was a good guy. Yes, he was, except when he was drunk, which was most of the time. Smash pounded the counter and chuckled. Your mom, on the other hand. She was the real deal, one of those charming ladies like you see in the movies but never really meet in real life. The kind you hope to marry and have kids with. I remember she made a mean oatmeal cookie, too. Smash was the second person to bring up those cookies in as many days. His mom had loved baking for all his friends, but particularly Smash and Viper. They're just like little kids, 
she had said with a laugh, riding their bikes and eating cookies. She made the best, Smash said. I miss her. You and me both, buddy. You and me both. Cole continued to talk with Smash and drank enough water so that riding his bike wouldn't be a problem. When it was time to go, he made the rounds, saying goodbye to his friends. They all mentioned the ride home again before he took off, and he promised at least five other bikers that he'd think about it. Smash and a few other guys, including Smash, were leaving at the same time. Hey, Cole, Smash said. You still have that old helmet you said I could have for my kid? A few years ago, Cole had found an old hot rod helmet at a garage sale. It was black and red with bright gold and copper flames, easily the coolest brain bucket he'd ever seen, so he bought it and hung it on a nail in his mother's garage. It had been there ever since. Smash's kid collected vintage riding gear, so when he found out, Cole had offered it to him. He'd forgotten all about it. Yep, it's at my mother's house. You guys want to just follow me over on your way home? I can grab it for you. Smash looked at the others, and they all shrugged and nodded in agreement. Outside the bar, the afternoon sun blazing down, they mounted their bikes and followed Cole, single file, all the way back to Mom's house. Cole was happy for the diversion. There was more packing in his immediate future, but at least he'd have his buddies to distract him for a while longer. When he pulled up, he parked at the curb in front of Jill's house. Jill and Stanley were doing sidewalk art again inside the house's picket fence enclosure. Jill glanced up at him and the other bikers, then quickly looked away. Guilt at how he'd hurt her last night once again swept through him. He paused on the sidewalk to talk to her. Stanley immediately stood, a huge smile on his face. Cole couldn't resist smiling back. Hi, mister, Stanley said. Hey, kid, what you making there? Stanley had been drawing something on the driveway with a stick of blue chalk that looked like a cross between a bicycle and an alien baby. A motorcycle? Stanley said, proud of his work. Cool. It looks like mine. Who's that big guy standing next to it? Next to the motorcycle, Stanley had drawn a giant stick figure that might have been the alien baby's father. He'd put circles around the upper arms to make them seem more muscular. Stanley grinned. It's me. You, Cole laughed. You need to eat a bit more spinach there, buddy. Stanley smiled sheepishly. It's me when I grow up. Ah, gotcha, Cole said. He turned to Jill. Hi. Hi, she said, not meeting his gaze. Cole sighed. Yep, she was still pissed. He should probably come back to talk to her when Stanley wasn't there. See you later, he said. Bye, Stanley cried. Jill didn't respond. Cole walked up to join Smash and the other guys. Smash was staring at Jill, his eyes twinkling. Pretty lady. She is, Cole agreed. The door to Jill's house opened, and the blonde girl he'd seen yesterday, Jill had called her a teacher's aide, came out. She called Stanley, who took one last look at Cole before running inside. You guys want to come in? He asked Smash. Smash shook his head. Thanks, but we'll let you get back to things. Catch up later. Cole nodded. Be right back. He went to the garage to retrieve the helmet for Smash. When he returned, Cole's friends were standing on one side of Jill's picket fence while she stood on the other. They all watched as Jill's pretty aide walked to the street corner and began talking to a punky-looking guy in baggy, low-slung jeans and a black baseball cap. The girl looked stiff at first, but she quickly relaxed when the boy gave her a hug. Then she waved at Jill, and she and the boy got into a beat-up pickup truck and drove off. Smash looked up and saw him. Hey, Cole, we were just introducing ourselves to Jill. Cole slowly crossed the yard to join them. He got there just in time to hear a guy named Juicy call her ma'am. Jill laughed softly, sending a shiver through Cole. Oh, no way am I a ma'am already. Who was the guy who just left? Cole asked. Monica's boyfriend. They were heading on a vacation today, but they got into a fight. She was upset and asked to come by, but he called. I guess they made up. Jill shrugged. I don't particularly like him, but she obviously sees something in him I don't. Jill still didn't look at Cole. The smile she gave the other men was dazzling, however. 
I'm so pleased to meet you all. It's a nice day for a ride, isn't it? Beautiful, meh, uh, Joe, Smash said, looking up. Beautiful day. Do you ride? No, I mean, I've been on a Harley. Once. She looked quickly at Cole before glancing away again. You should try it again, Rod told her. Maybe I will, she said with an indulgent smile. Well, have a great day. Liz and the kids are waiting for me. With a wave, she walked back into her house. Smash glanced at Cole. Pretty and sweet. The real deal. Cole couldn't help but smile. She and my mom got along well. Smash raised an eyebrow. Oh, yeah? Your mom was a good judge of character. She loved me, after all. Cole laughed and handed Smash the helmet for his son. He talked with the guys for several more minutes before they got on their bikes to leave. They'd just pulled out when Jill came back outside and started gathering toys and art supplies. Taking a deep breath, Cole crossed the yard once again, calling out just as she turned back to her front door. Jill, can I talk to you for a minute? She hesitated and looked over her shoulder at him. Her expression was wistful, but she shook her head. I think you already said enough, she said quietly. Have a good day, Cole. She stepped inside and softly closed the door behind her. Jill knew Stanley was still thinking about Cole from the way the boy kept looking out the window toward Cole's house. Jill understood perfectly. She had spent the day trying to stop herself from doing the same thing. The biker next door was like the sun, a magnetic force that attracted her and made her want to stay in his orbit. A son who sometimes said rude things as if it were a newborn, immature star. But despite that, he still drew her in. She knew if she circled too closely, if she stayed too long, she would burn up and disintegrate. That was easy enough to remember when she was angry with him for saying asinine things. But since he'd apologized multiple times now, it was getting more difficult to fight her attraction. Because of that, she'd tried so hard to hold on to her anger from last night. It had been almost impossible, given the way he'd asked Stanley about his drawing, smiled at the boy, and given him compliments. For a moment, she'd felt her heart swell. Cole's warmth had swept through her, pulling her dangerously close to the sun once again. She had forced herself to pull back and reject his apology. If she didn't let herself fall victim to his magnetic pull, she wouldn't be devastated when he decided to insult her again. Or when he left, for that matter. Because he was leaving. She had to remember that. And that's why she had to act, not with emotion, but with the cool logic that told her to stay away. Simply put, it was in everyone's best interest. She was preparing lunch when Stanley tugged on her shirt. Miss Jill, I think he's sad. Who's sad, honey? The giant next door. She cocked her head to the side. Why would you say that? I looked out the window and saw him. Why do you think the giant is sad? She struggled with what to say. She could tell Stanley that Cole's mother had died, which meant the man was grieving, but she didn't think that was the best idea. She could also tell him the truth, that the giant had said some mean things and now he felt bad. I'm not sure, she said instead. Maybe you should go talk to him. If I was sad, you'd talk to me, right? Of course I would. Are you sad? Jill crouched and looked directly into Stanley's brown eyes. He shook his head. You're sure? Because you know you can always talk to me. He looked at her and nodded. You should talk to that man because he's sad. He whirled around. I'm going to go play now. And just like that, he scuttled off to play Legos with the other kids in the living room. Jill envied his ability to just shake things off and continue as if nothing happened. If only she could do the same. She thought about Stanley's father, Jason, again. The way he always lingered for just a minute whenever he came to pick Stanley up. At times, she'd gotten the feeling that Jason had a crush on her. She ignored it, mostly because he gave her the creeps, but more than once, she'd seen someone lingering outside after hours and wondered if maybe it hadn't been him. She didn't have any reason to believe it was Jason. However, 
she had plenty of reason to believe Cole was sad. It had nothing to do with the way she'd blown him off earlier, though that probably hadn't helped. Worry and guilt, my two oldest friends. She'd spent so much of her life feeling them. Guilt as she'd watched her father deteriorate from a vibrant young man to a shell of himself practically overnight. Worry that she couldn't do enough for him or that he didn't know how much she loved him. Worry that she'd be walking the same path as her father some day. She glanced out the window at Stella's house and wondered what Cole might be doing. Probably packing his mother's things, missing her. It was human nature to think you had forever to say the things that needed to be said to your loved ones. Or to do the things that needed to be done. You should talk to that man because he's sad. Cole obviously felt bad for what he'd said to her and had apologized right away, immediately afterward and then again today. It made her heart ache, remembering the way he'd looked when she'd thrown his apology back in his face. If he was over there struggling with his grief and regret, it was partly because she'd made things harder for him. And that was a thought she couldn't bear. Chapter 7 Cole sat in the middle of the kitchen floor, watching the shadows dance across the wall as car headlights passed by. It was early evening and the sun was going down. He'd made great headway by packing up his mother's guest room. Now he sat surrounded by a stack of cardboard boxes and tissue paper, wrapping up dishes and pans. He hadn't ventured back into his mother's bedroom, figuring he would leave that room for last, along with the china hutch. His thoughts kept turning to Jill. Just let it go, Cole. She made it clear she wanted nothing else to do with him. He had to respect that. It just wasn't what the universe wanted from them. A knock on the front door pulled him out of his pity party. He pushed himself up off the floor. When he pulled open the door, he found Jill standing there, holding a Tupperware container and a bottle of wine. Hi, she said. Hey, he said relief washing through him. I should probably still be mad about what you said last night. She looked down at the food container. Are you? A little. You really hurt my feelings. That's just not me, Cole. But I thought about it, and I figured it's not your fault. I didn't exactly give you much opportunity to know me first. He leaned heavily against the door frame. It was still stupid of me. I'm sorry. Well, I decided to forgive you, but only because I'm craving conversation with someone who has been potty trained for at least a few years. She smiled sweetly. He stared at her for a long time. Something about her smile made his heart clench, and he sucked in a quick breath. So, are you going to invite me in, or should I keep standing here? She said. Oh, no, come on in. He jumped back, clearing the doorway. Thanks, you'd be surprised how heavy Chicken Alfredo gets after a while. Jill stepped in and looked around. I'm a big fan of Chicken Alfredo. Cole flipped on the lamp. Excuse the mess, I was packing. So I see. Do you mind if I heat this up? I don't know if you've eaten yet, but I'm starving. Sure, of course. He watched her breeze across the floor and head into the kitchen, where she proceeded to warm up the dinner in the microwave. It smelled delicious, and his stomach protested loudly. Jill opened the cabinet, obviously familiar with the setup, but paused. The plates? Oh, they're in here now. He gestured to the box on the floor, opened it, and took out two plates. That smells great, he said. He pulled out a chair at the bar and sat down. When do you find time to cook with all those kids underfoot all day? I don't. I have to do it when they're not there. I got tired of quickie, pre-packaged meals every night, so on the weekends, I cook, then freeze my meals for the week. The microwave dinged. He watched her fix their plates and take two glasses out of a cabinet. Wine? she asked. Water will work. Okay, go sit at the dining room table and I'll bring it out. Yes, ma'am. Cole wasn't used to being told what to do or where to sit, but he did as she asked. He figured she was still in teacher mode after a full day of running a daycare. More likely, she was still in nurturing mode, and he had to admit it felt good to be nurtured again. 
She brought out the plates and cups and slid one in front of him. You look pretty experienced at this. I serve up seven plates at least twice a day, sometimes three if a kid's mommy or daddy is late. She set her plate down and placed the glasses in front of each. Cole took a bite and closed his eyes. It was the perfect blend of flavors. Amazing, he said, knowing he wasn't just talking about the food. They made small talk while they ate, telling each other about their days. He enjoyed being with her in such a simple, relaxed way. She was talented, smart, capable, sweet, wild. In some ways, it felt like they'd known each other forever. She made him feel at ease, free and secure, warm, safe. Cole had never felt this way about a woman before. When he wasn't with her, he was thinking of her. But feelings that intense wouldn't last. It was probably just because they had unfinished business. Because they'd only had that one perfect night together, and he wanted more of the same. But he didn't want a relationship. The thought of being tied to one place and one woman terrified him. He knew, without a doubt, that his mother had been right. Any man would be lucky to have Jill in his life. But it couldn't be him. He wanted fewer complications in life, not more. And yet, here she was, now, sharing a meal with him. He'd concentrate on that miraculous fact while he could, and enjoy it. When they were done eating, Cole found some coffee and made them each a cup. That's when she told him how Stanley had been worried about him. I guess he could see you through the window? To him, you're the giant next door, so I guess the thought of you being sad. That's sweet of him to care, but I'm fine, Cole said. I care too, you know. Startled, he looked up, then reached out and took her hand. Thank you, Jill. That means a lot to me. And it did. Right now, it meant everything, and despite all his mental reminders that he couldn't have anything long-term with Jill... The thought that she was soon going to walk out the door again had him almost panicking. You don't have to leave right away, do you? She hesitated. Finally, she let out a soft rush of breath. No, I don't have to leave. In fact, I'd like to help you with some of this packing. You don't have to help with that. I want to. Stella was important to me, and I... I like you, Cole. I want to help. Please? She gave him a great set of puppy dog eyes. Just let me? He appreciated that she wanted to help him, even after putting in a full day of work. And he didn't ask for help often. But accepting Jill's help meant one very important thing. He'd get more time with her. Follow me, he said. He led her down the hall to the third bedroom, which his mom had used as an office. When he opened the door, Jill's mouth dropped open. Wow. Cole smiled. Bookshelves lined the walls from floor to ceiling all around. They were filled with books from children's little golden books to Tom Clancy novels. My mom liked to read. She used to read to me all the time when I was a kid. This is quite a collection, she said. She gave the kids some books, but I had no idea she'd never brought me in here. She was quite a collector, of all sorts of things. Books, knickknacks, my old art from when I was a kid. He stared at the books a while. I guess we should pack these up. Well, books are definitely less fragile, she said. I'll get some boxes. She left and came back a few minutes later with several boxes from the living room. Thank you, he said simply. Jill nodded and sat by the bookshelf. Oh, I loved this story, she said, holding up a children's book. You want some books for the daycare? He asked, looking at the shelf. Why hadn't he offered right away was beyond him. They would be in perfect hands. She looked up from her spot on the floor, first at him and then at the shelves. That's not why I came here. He frowned. I know that. Believe me, I regret what I said to you, Jill. You're not manipulative. In fact, you're incredible. Those kids and their parents are so lucky to have you. Well, thank you for the compliment and the books. She smiled, slapping the book shut and placing it in the empty box.
As they packed away the books, they talked about which ones they'd both read as adults and which ones were their favorites as kids. Turned out they had the same taste in books, but then again, Cole shouldn't have been so surprised. Cole loved mysteries with a twist at the end, and Jill's eyes widened with surprise just before she said she loved them too. They also had a mutual love of historical fiction and true crime. What shocked Cole, however, was when Jill admitted she loved all things horror, be it a novel or a movie. In fact, my favorite horror novel that I read last year was, let me guess, something by Stephen King, he said. Close, it was called Heart-Shaped Box by Joe Hill. And that's close because he tilted his head at her. Because Joe Hill is Stephen King's son, she said like it was common knowledge. Oh, wow, you just taught me something. She set a book down on her lap and leaned into him. Well, I am a teacher of babies, Mr. Cole. She held it together pretty good for a moment, but then she started laughing. Very funny. He smiled at her, loving the musical quality of her laughter. They went on talking and laughing, and every so often, he caught her gaze wandering over him. She was checking him out, maybe remembering their time together, maybe wanting more. For him, there was no maybe. He definitely wanted more time with Jill. He couldn't have a whole lot, but he'd take whatever he could get. Chapter 8 the next morning, when Liz showed up a full half hour before she was supposed to, Jill knew the time of reckoning had come. Mostly, she was glad. Even packing a few boxes with him had her feelings for Cole building into a confusing mass of emotions, and she'd started to panic at the thought of him leaving in a few days. She'd be hurt no matter what. So what was the point of stopping herself from enjoying him while he was here? Staying away from him might not actually be accomplishing anything. Her resolve to keep things friendly and fun between them was apparently crumbling under the temptation that was Cole. Sitting at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee, Jill faced Liz with hope that talking to her friend could help her sort things out. But apparently Liz had already put two and two together. So tell me the truth. You're flirting with the giant next door, aren't you? And dare I suggest, you're doing way more than flirting? She lifted her glass of orange juice and stared at Jill as she sipped. He's pretty torn up over losing his mom. He just needs a friend right now. Liz stilled. Okay, so you just packed last night. But what about the night you met? Jill looked at Liz, smiled, then covered her eyes with her hands, only to peek at her friend through the spaces between her fingers. We flirted, we kissed, and... Aha! I knew it! Liz slapped the table and sat back, satisfied. Then she leaned forward. How was it? Jill sighed heavily and lowered her hands. Indescribable but I wasn't even supposed to see him again before he showed up next door. He's heading to San Fran soon. We're over. You really believe that? Liz asked. Yes, Jill shook her head. She laughed ruefully. No, I'm trying to make myself believe it, but I'm starting to cave. And that frightens me. If I let myself have more, I'm going to want the whole package. And that's not something Cole can give me. Liz covered Jill's hand with hers. I'm glad you went out of your comfort zone a little. You've spent so much of your life taking care of people. First your daddy, having to take care of him every day when he couldn't even remember your name. Liz shuddered. I can't imagine how hard that was on you. Then having to be strong for your mom until the end. And now taking care of these babies every day. You deserve some plain old fun sometimes. But I'm glad you're being careful. I don't want you to get hurt. I don't want me to get hurt either. That's exactly what I'm trying to avoid. He'll be gone soon. I just want to help him through this if I can. But I'm keeping my head about me and my hands to myself. I have to. Just remember, Liz said, it's not your job to take care of him. He's a big boy, Jill. Oh, yes, he is, Jill thought. 
The rest of the day flew by. Seven scrambled eggs on toast and seven glasses of milk. Seven brushings of teeth and washing of hands. A little bit of cartoon watching until everyone was there, then working on numbers one to ten, practicing ABCs for the older kids, and stacking blocks for the little ones. Snack time, shoots and ladders, lunch time, naps, crafts, then story time. It all whizzed by in a blur until finally they all sat down with snacks and a movie as one by one the kids got picked up to go home. Jill sat with Anaya on her lap and Charlie pressed up against her other side. Together they relaxed in a big, happy clump. By the time six o'clock rolled around, only Jill and Stanley were left. Stanley's father was getting later and later with his pickups, with no explanation or prior arrangements. Yes, given some of their kids had parents who were sick, she was all about being flexible. She would be flexible even in cases where a family member wasn't sick, as was the case with Stanley. But Jason's tardiness was unexplained and frequent. It just wasn't right. She'd hate to start charging him extra, but she didn't want to feel taken advantage of, either. She'd have to talk to him about it. But worst of all was her worry over what Stanley might be feeling, like maybe his dad didn't want to come get him. Fifteen minutes after the movie ended, the doorbell rang. Finally. She opened the door to let Jason in and took out Stanley's things from his cubby. She struggled with her conscience. She really needed to inform Jason he must be on time, but she didn't want to lecture the man in front of his son. She'd give him a call tomorrow, she decided, then knelt down to say goodbye to Stanley. You be good, okay? I'll see you tomorrow. She gave him her usual parting hug. Stanley surprised her by putting his little arms around her neck and hugging her tightly. He wasn't usually such a physically affectionate kid. Bye, Miss Jill he said before letting go. When she straightened up, Jason surprised her even more by touching her arm. She had to physically hold herself in place to keep from jerking away. Nothing ever bad happens to him here. Jason stared into Jill's eyes a little too long. I tell him all the time how lucky he is he gets to spend so much time with you. Jill plastered on a polite smile. Oh, how lovely. Thank you. She tried not to sound too happy so he wouldn't pay her another compliment. He was only being polite, but still, she didn't want to encourage him either. Evening, a male voice said behind them. Jill took the opportunity to step back and out of Jason's touch. Cole, hello! She smiled at Cole and tried sending him please help me vibes through her widened eyes. Come on in and I'll get you what you needed. Cole apparently recognized the discomfort in her stance and gaze. He moved in a little closer. Yeah, the thing I was coming to get. Excuse me, he said to Jason so he could get past him. Jason hadn't stopped staring at Jill but eventually turned to face Cole. Stanley darted out the door and passed his father, his head down, but Jason didn't move. The two men stood with their feet braced apart, sizing each other up. Cole Novak, Cole said with his hand out. Jill let out a breath as Jason shook hands with him. Jason Baker, Cole nodded. Stanley's dad, I take it. Something flashed over Jason's face, but Jill couldn't figure out the emotion. Instead of glancing at his son, Jason shoved past Cole and walked out the door. He paused halfway down the walkway and turned around. Cole slid one massive arm across her shoulders and said softly, Baby, I couldn't stop thinking about you all day. Suddenly, Cole leaned down and planted a kiss on her mouth. Then he shut the door. Oh my God, Cole, thank you! Without thinking about it, Jill rested her head against Cole's chest and took several breaths. What was that? He nudged her back to look in her eyes. Oh, I'm sorry, I... She immediately felt her cheeks heat. Maybe she shouldn't have reached out and touched Cole to calm her nerves. No, not you, he said, lacing his arm around her shoulder again. I mean, what was that vibe between you and that guy? Nothing. She waved a hand. 
I'm not buying it. As soon as I saw your face, I knew whatever was happening wasn't good. Has he been causing problems? No, no problems. He brings Stanley here five days a week, and now he's picking him up later and later. She didn't want to mention how she suspected Jason was interested in her. She was afraid Cole would think she was trying to make him jealous, but then again, it was probably all very clear from the interaction he saw. Hmm, maybe he's just looking for an excuse to see you every day and get you alone, Cole said. You sure you're okay? You're not mad I snuck in a kiss? No, but can you call that a kiss? She said. Oh man, she was flirting and she knew it. Is that a challenge or an invitation? He stepped even closer. Her heartbeat rang in her ears as she breathed him in. It should be illegal for any one man to smell that nice. How was she supposed to resist him? She couldn't. Not anymore. She wanted this and didn't care if it was right or not. Cole was leaving. But he wanted her, and she couldn't resist the chance to enjoy whatever time he had left here. Do you want me to give you a real kiss, Jill? He lowered his voice. The effect was the same as a sledgehammer tearing down one last piece of wall. She reached for him and laid her palm flat on his chest. He understood the invitation and closed the gap between them, sliding a hand behind her head to tilt her face up. He kissed her and she closed her eyes to soak him in. You really are beautiful, he said, his voice soft. You're beautiful, too. Beautiful enough to want to spend more time with me? His voice was hopeful but ready for rejection just the same. Look, he said softly, you know exactly where I'm at in my life. That I can't make you any promises beyond being here for the next couple of days. Maybe it's wrong of me to ask for more time with you, but I'm asking. I enjoy your company. I want to get to know you better. It'd be a waste if we let the opportunity to spend more time together go by, don't you think? She nibbled her lip. She wasn't sure of anything at this point. Why not just go for whatever the universe threw her way? So what would be the rules? We'll date for the time we have left together? What do you say to having a whatever-we-want-to-do rule? Starting when? How about we have dinner first? Then I show you exactly what it is I have in mind. She smiled, feeling good, feeling okay and at peace. What fun was life if she never gave in to adventure? Besides, she wasn't going to have a choice when Cole left, and that wasn't all bad. She wouldn't have to worry about him falling for her when she didn't know what the future had in store, when she didn't know if someday soon she'd begin to forget who he was and what they'd meant to each other. Yes, she'd have to deal with the pain of him eventually leaving, but she could enjoy every minute with him she had left, without worry or guilt on his behalf. Let's do it. An hour later, after eating takeout food at Cole's mom's place, Jill helped him do the dishes, then leaned back against the counter. So, she said, rubbing her hands together, which room are you in the process of packing? Mom's bedroom. He grimaced and ran a hand through his hair. It had to be done, but he certainly wasn't looking forward to it. She winced in sympathy. Yeah, that might be a hard one. Unless... He narrowed his eyes at her. Unless what? She smiled mischievously. Let me ask you this. Have you packed up your old room yet? Because your mom showed it to me once. And? And it was so... Teenage boy... He chuckled. Probably a good thing, since that's what I was at the time. What are you getting at? Well, I was just thinking we should start packing by splitting up. Doesn't sound like much fun. Well, now, just hear me out. Maybe you could start packing up your mom's room while I pack up your room, and if you make enough progress, you can come visit me, and maybe there will even be rewards in it for you. Ooh, positive reinforcement, he crooned. I like it, so what kind of reward can I expect? I mean, if I know ahead of time what incentive to look forward to, I'll do a better job. Hmm, let's see. 
Maybe a kiss? She tapped her pursed lips and smiled. Baby, one of your kisses is a treasure for sure, but my mom has a lot of stuff in her bedroom. As much as I enjoy your kisses, that's a lot for one kiss. Wow, and here I thought one kiss would do for the entire house. She laughed. Hmm. Well, okay then. How about for each box you fill, I take off one piece of clothing? Does that work? His smile widened. He took her hand and gently guided her to his old bedroom. Now, that's a deal. Grabbing a box, he quickly but carefully began packing up his mother's things. Ten minutes later, done with the first box, he strode into his room, where Jill was carefully putting his various trophies and frames in a box. She whipped around at the sound of his voice. Wow, really? That was fast? I was motivated. Well, you know what they say, patience is a virtue. Virtues are for schmucks. I want my reward. Then he bent his head slightly and pressed his lips to hers for a sweet kiss. Chapter 9 The next morning, Jill focused on work and the kids, but several times she had to tamp down her excitement to see Cole again. He'd asked her to go for a bike ride with him that evening. For someone who'd never been particularly interested in motorcycles before, she was turning into a certified addict. At seven o'clock that evening, Cole knocked on the door, and she opened it in a rush, taking in his hotness in jeans, t-shirt, and biker boots. He'd just taken a shower and looked and smelled good enough to eat. Wow, you look great, Jill. She wore denim capris, a white lace t-shirt with a white camisole underneath, and white sneaks. Her long hair had been pulled back and tied with a scarf. Thank you, she said. I was planning on it just being the two of us tonight, but I was wondering if you were up for meeting some friends of mine for drinks? They called earlier, checking in on me, and, well... He rubbed the back of his neck. They're worried about you? What good friends. I'd love to meet them. Taking her hand, he led her to his bike, which he'd pulled out of the garage and parked at the curb. She smiled when she saw an extra black helmet on the handlebars. It was a bit smaller than his and looked brand new. It's a beautiful night, she said. Not as beautiful as you, he said. He got on the bike and Jill slipped on her helmet and climbed on. She loved the way it felt to sit behind him with her hands around his waist. She liked the feeling of the wind rushing in her face. She liked the scent of jasmine in the evening air and the fact that she would never experience the heady scent if she were in a car. There was something freeing about the whole experience. They drove for almost thirty minutes as he headed into Burbank. Soon he pulled into Folsom's, a quaint little place Jill had heard good things about. Loud music drifted through the walls, spiking in intensity whenever someone opened the door. As they got off Cole's bike, a tall, extremely handsome man with dark hair and steel eyes, dressed in slacks and a crisp button-down shirt, strode up to them. About time you showed up. Cole grinned and both men slapped each other on the back. Jill, this is Luke, my friend and business partner in Frontline. It's nice to meet you, Luke. She shook his hand, and he cupped both of hers in both of his. The pleasure is mine, Jill. Thanks for taking care of Cole here. I appreciate it. She smiled and glanced at Cole. Feeling bold, she said, that's been my pleasure. She giggled when Cole actually blushed a little. Luke burst out laughing. I see what you mean, Cole. Sweet and wild. Now come on, Gabe's waiting inside. As they started to make their way through the crowd, Jill turned to Cole. Sweet and wild, huh? She was teasing him, but it was a huge compliment that he'd described her that way to Luke. If there was one thing she was afraid of, it was that she was a little too boring for a guy like Cole. But he obviously recognized that he brought out her wild side, and just as obviously, he liked it. Cole loosely wrapped his arms around her from behind, even as they kept walking. He put his mouth to her ear and growled, That's right, I love both sides of you, sweet and wild. As far as I'm concerned, it's the best combination, and always will be. Cole seriously considered turning around and guiding Jill toward the exit. 
He loved his friends, and he'd been excited for them to meet Jill, but suddenly he wanted it to be just the two of them again, the way it had been last night. Too late. Gabe was already headed their way. While an outside observer might see Cole and Luke as opposites on a spectrum, Gabe would fall somewhere in the middle. Luke almost always wore formal clothes. Cole almost always dressed down. Gabe liked to straddle both styles. He wore a tux like he'd been born in one, but looked just as suave wearing dark-fitted jeans and a light sweater, the way he was now. Few people would guess that Gabe had survived a tough childhood, that he'd virtually grown up on the streets and had to fight for everything he had. It was a testament to his intelligence and strength that he was now a corporate mogul with a powerhouse chain of outdoor recreation stores that was big with extreme sports enthusiasts. For the next hour, Cole watched Jill charm his college buddies just like she'd charmed Smash and the other bikers. It didn't seem to matter who she was talking to. Jill showed a genuine interest in people, no matter their backgrounds. She was open and friendly, asking a lot of questions, but also willing to share her own experiences. She even explained how she'd learned to play darts in college, and how that had come in handy when she'd met a biker in a bar recently. Both Gabe and Luke laughed as if that was the funniest thing they'd ever heard. Well, it's too bad Cole didn't meet you a week earlier, Luke said. You could have joined us in Coronado for the wedding. What wedding? Jill asked. In his peripheral vision, Cole saw Gabe stiffen and sighed. Gabe was Eric's best friend, and he'd been assigned the role of best man at Eric's should-have-happened wedding. Eric leaving Brianne at the altar without any warning or explanation was affecting Gabe the hardest. Luke's expression grew serious. I shouldn't have brought that up. You're right, you shouldn't have brought it up, Gabe growled. He looked at Jill. I like you, Jill, but Luke here should know better than to casually share something so personal. Now, if you'll excuse me for a moment, I have to make a phone call. With a final look at Luke, Gabe stood and walked away. Luke sighed, then glanced at Jill. Excuse me, Jill. No problem she said softly. Cole clamped Luke on the shoulder. You didn't do anything wrong. The only person who's in the wrong here is Eric. Noting how quiet Jill had gotten, Cole explained. Our friend Eric, Gabe's best friend, was supposed to get married last week, but he ended up leaving his fiancée, Brianne, another friend of ours, at the altar with no explanation other than a text that Brianne hasn't shared with us. The only thing she'll say is that Eric was obviously having doubts, so it's better they didn't go through with their vows. He texted her right before the wedding to call things off? Jill's tone was horrified. Yes. Cole searched the room for Gabe, but couldn't see him. Except for an initial email letting us know he's okay and will be in touch soon, Eric's been MIA. As Eric's best friend, Gabe's taking it the hardest. I mean, we'd just thrown him a bachelor party in Vegas and everything seemed fine. We're supposed to be friends. Why wouldn't he have said anything? It doesn't make sense. Jill didn't respond and Cole frowned at her downcast eyes. Jill? She shot him a smile, though it was obviously strained. I'm sorry, Luke said. I didn't mean to bring everyone down. Jill shook her head. No, no, it's fine. I just... I always try to look at things from everyone's point of view. And if Eric's a good friend, I imagine he has to be a pretty good guy. Sometimes people don't share their secrets with those that mean the most to them because they're afraid of what they'll think. Afraid something precious will be lost. Jill sounded so sad, as if she had some deep, dark secret that she was afraid to share. It didn't sit right with him. But he'd only known her a few days. And she'd been reluctant to talk about her father. Maybe there was a story there. Cole reached out and took Jill's hand, relieved when she squeezed and her expression cleared. A minute later, Gabe returned, and though he was still a little tense... He did his best to make Jill comfortable again. While they were talking about Gabe's chain of outdoor adventure stores, Luke asked if he could talk to Cole about business. Sure, 
Cole said. Excuse me for a second, Jill? Of course, she said, smiling sweetly before turning back to Gabe. Cole and Luke settled into a table in the corner to talk. I just wanted to let you know everything's under control. We've taken a couple of new jobs, and I had a meet-and-greet with an actress's manager. She's headed out of town for a shoot in a few weeks. Which actress? Kathleen Bailey. Cole whistled softly. Cat Bailey was currently one of Hollywood's biggest rom-com princesses, with trademark red hair and the unfortunate honor of being part of one of last year's most talked-about scandals. She'd been half of a Hollywood power couple, dating Ray Hamilton, the director from one of her past movies, when a college intern claimed she'd slept with Hamilton. For a week, Bailey stood by her man's side, insisting the intern was lying. Then the tabloids published photos, not only of Hamilton frolicking on a beach with the intern, but of Bailey that the intern claimed were leaked by Hamilton himself. Publicly, Bailey had handled the scandal as gracefully as possible, but then she'd gone underground, avoiding reporters and the tabloids like the plague. So tell me about her, Cole said. I haven't met her yet, but I don't think we should take the job. She got a few threats from fans unhappy with how she handled the breakup with Hamilton, so she's not sold on protection. Guarding a body that's resisting being guarded, especially an uppity actress, no thanks. Cole frowned. I agree. Playing games means unnecessary risk. Right, and it's not like we're hurting for business. Still, I'm going to research the threats, maybe talk to her manager again before making up my mind. I'll keep you posted. Great. Cole ran a hand through his hair as his gaze found Jill. She was laughing at something Gabe was saying. When Gabe reached out and touched her arm in a friendly gesture, Cole was shocked to feel himself stiffen with jealousy. What was that about? They were just talking, and it wasn't like Cole had any claim on Jill. Still, he turned back to Luke. If that's all, I'd like to have Jill to myself for a while. I'm surprised you lasted this long his friend said. I've never seen you like this with anyone. She's amazing, Luke. I want to spend as much time as I can with her before I get back to work and things get crazy. Right, Luke said, though it was obvious he was holding something back. What is it? It's just what we talked about before, Cole. It still applies. You're entitled to some time off, to figure out what you really want in life. Luke's gaze deliberately found Jill before returning to Cole. It's not like that, Luke. I just met her. But it could be like that. Are you staying open to that possibility, or are you just so busy planning the move to San Francisco that you can't see anything else? You told me to take time for myself, to travel, to see the world. Jill's a daycare teacher who loves her job and her life here. Those aren't things that go together. No, they don't unless you're willing to find a way to make them. Ten minutes later, Jill was saying goodbye to Luke, and Cole took Gabe aside. Look, I know with Eric M.I.A. things aren't good. I'm here for you. You want to talk? Don't hesitate. I've already told Brianne the same thing. I don't know what's going on with Eric, but we're going to get through this. Together. Something flickered across Gabe's face when Cole said Brianne's name, but it was quickly gone. Thanks, Cole. They returned to the table. It was wonderful to meet you, Jill. I hope we'll see each other again. Likewise, Gabe. Gabe turned to Luke. You want to stay a bit longer? Luke raised his mug. Sounds good to me. Take care, you two. With a final wave, Jill and Cole headed out and got settled on his bike. Cole thought about what Luke had said about opening himself up to the possibility of a future with Jill. He didn't come up with any solutions, nothing that seemed realistic anyway. But because his mind was focused on work and Jill and responsibility and passion and whether it was possible to balance all of them, he suddenly thought of another place he wanted to take her. When they'd left the bar, Cole hadn't told Jill where they were going, saying only that he wanted to surprise her. Soon, they were in front of a large, three-story glass building with a sign that read, Frontline Security. It was his office, she realized. They got off the bike, and Jill slipped off her helmet, shaking out her hair. So this is your building, huh? 
It's very nice. Did you and Luke discuss something about work that you needed to attend to? Something like that. He pulled her in close, and they stood on the side of the busy street and kissed. When Cole pulled away, she was completely breathless. I've always had this fantasy about kissing a beautiful woman in my private office. I was wondering if you'd be interested in helping me out with that. Sounds like that would be equally advantageous for me. I'll do my best. He winked at her, then unlocked the front door, resetting the security system as soon as they were inside. He locked the door behind them and then in one swift movement backed her against it. He kissed her mouth, then the side of her face, then her neck. Slowly he released her, took her by the hand and led her down the dark hall to a large oak door with his name on a gold plate. Ooh, is Mr. Novak in? Jill cooed, enjoying the way her nerves buzzed with anticipation. I'll check, he said playfully. Do you have an appointment? Yes, yes I do, she said. A private one. Cole smiled that gorgeous, blinding smile of his as he unlocked the door. He led them into his office and once again closed and locked the door behind them. Here we are, he said. It was dark and Jill couldn't see much of his office. Nothing too exciting. If you've seen one office, you've seen them all. Maybe, she thought, but there was only one Cole Novak, and she intended to use her appointment time with him wisely. Chapter 10 Jill's nerves were humming now with barely contained energy. What had happened to the tame woman she once was? How could it be that in a matter of days a man would come into her world and turn it upside down? Turn her inside out? She was no longer the bland daycare provider Jill when she was with Cole. Somehow he'd unlocked doors inside her she hadn't even known existed. With a trembling hand, Jill reached over and unlocked the office door. Cole pulled back. It's okay if you don't want to do this. Oh, she wanted to do this. I'm fine. I just need a minute to get ready. Do you mind waiting in the outer office for just a few minutes? An idea was brewing in her mind, making her giddy with excitement. Cole drew his brows together. Are you sure everything's okay? Is this too weird for you? Just wait outside for a few. Okay. He was still rooted to the spot, so she pulled open the door and gently pushed him out. There was no way she could move him on her own, but finally he took a step forward. She gently shut the door before looking around. Go big or go home, she thought, heading over to Cole's oversized oak desk. It was neat and organized. She moved the phone and his in and out boxes off the desk and set them temporarily on the ledge along the window behind it. She removed the blotter, then, spotting a soft afghan on the back of his leather sofa, she covered the desk with it. Finally, she switched off the bright fluorescent overhead light before taking her phone out of her purse and lying down across the desk. Butterflies did somersaults in her stomach, the tickling sensation reminding her of how she felt when she was on the back of Cole's bike. She loved it. After pressing Cole's number into her phone, he answered immediately. Hello? Mr. Novak? She heard him laugh softly. Yes, Miss Jones, but why are you being so formal? I like to be professional at work. I'm afraid I can't find what I need in your office, and it's something I need very badly. Is that right? He chuckled, though there was a harsh, breathless quality that told her his imagination was going exactly where she wanted it to. Yes, sir. I've looked everywhere for it. Maybe we'd have more luck if you helped me? I'll be right in. The next morning, Cole woke early, pleased that Jill was still beside him rather than back at her house. They'd returned to his mom's house after their escapade at his office, and Jill had fallen asleep in his arms. He took a moment to simply look at her and was blown away by her beauty. He'd never met anyone like her, and the more time he spent with her, the more time he wanted with her. He reached out to caress her hair, and she murmured and rolled closer to him. 
Glancing at the clock on the nightstand, he started. It was after seven already, and he knew her kids would start arriving at eight. Jill, he said, caressing her face. It's seven. Do you need to get going? Yes, she sighed, but let's snuggle first. Cole grinned. Five minutes later, he was still holding her as the light coming in from the window grew brighter. When his phone buzzed on the nightstand, she murmured something incoherent and slightly grumpy, which made him smile. Reaching across her, he picked up his phone and noted the caller. He turned back to Jill and nuzzled her hair, murmuring, It's Luke. Jill blinked, nodded sleepily, and started to get up, as if maybe he were kicking her out. Hey, where are you going? He protested. Stay, we're not done snuggling. She looked surprised, but then settled into him again. Reaching out, he traced the lines of her cheeks and chin with his fingertips. I'd be so gone for this girl if I let myself be, he thought. Chapter 11 Hey, Luke. Cole answered his phone. I'm sorry to bother you so early, especially when you're probably not alone, but I figured I'd give you as much warning as possible. Cole stiffened slightly, even though Luke didn't sound tense or worried. Jill could probably hear their conversation, and it surprised him how much he didn't care. He felt at ease with her, with nothing to hide. Except his growing feelings, of course. To Luke, he said, What's up? Have you heard from Eric? Cole laid his hand on Jill's thigh and smoothed lazy circles against her silky skin. No, sorry, not that. It's about a job. When I checked my messages last night, I'd received a call from the aide of Senator Taylor. Who? Cole said, realizing how disconnected from work he'd been before he and Jill connected there last night. The senator whose whole campaign was about going green? He's visiting L.A. for a conference and wants us on the security detail. And he asked specifically for you. Otherwise, I wouldn't be bothering you with this. Where's the conference? Staples Center. It starts in four days, lasts three days, and he wants to meet with you early morning the day after tomorrow. It sounded like he'd only be gone less than a week, but the thought of being away from Jill even that long bothered him. Which bothered him even more. He'd obviously grown too attached to her. And that was a big problem. Since when did the thought of leaving a woman make him hesitate for even one second to take a job? He had to pull himself together. That wasn't the kind of relationship he had with Jill. Being tied down to one woman, being tied down to any particular place, wasn't what he wanted or needed. So he forced himself to say, That'll work. Cole. Luke, Jill's here and I want to get back to her. I'll call you later and get the details for the meeting. He heard his friend sigh. Talk to you then. He disconnected the call, then glanced at Jill, who'd sat up. Looks like you have a great job waiting for you, she said. I'm sure it can only speed things along and get you to San Francisco all the sooner. Though her voice trembled just slightly, she wasn't being sarcastic. She sounded happy for him, or at least she was really trying to. He braced himself on an elbow to look at her. I don't want to cut our time short. This has been amazing. You're amazing. She smiled sadly, and it broke his heart. You're amazing, too, but we both knew this was coming. I've got to head to my place, but we can finish packing tonight. She got out of bed and grabbed her shirt off the floor. I'll call a storage company, see if they can have a truck here in the morning. He forced himself to smile, but Jill was getting dressed, avoiding eye contact, and talking about the day of work ahead. She was in self-preservation mode, already putting distance between them, laying down a stretch of blacktop for him to ride down and disappear forever. And normally, with any other woman, that would have been just fine. But Cole knew, after the time he'd spent with Jill, nothing about him would ever be normal again. Jill slogged into her house, flung her purse onto her bed, and fell onto the comforter with a huge sigh. Comforter was the right word because there was nothing like being in her own room, on her own bed, to bring reality and familiarity back. She had so many things to do today. She just needed some time to think. Or not think. 
Cole would be leaving tomorrow, and clearly he wasn't planning to come back given he was calling movers to pick up boxes and put them in storage tomorrow morning. Jill watched the ceiling fan go round and round above her, much like how the contents of her brain refused to stop swirling. She had to face facts. In only a few days, she'd fallen hard, despite her own warnings. Too hard. And soon she was going to pay the price. In a way, she already had. Because surely the reality of coal being gone couldn't be any worse than the anticipation of it. After showering and preparing for the day to come by setting out art supplies and building blocks, she sat at the kitchen table with her coffee, stirring her creamer in, absent-mindedly. Liz came in, hung her key on the wall, and paused when she saw Jill. Wow, what happened to you? She smiled tightly, knowing she probably looked like she was grieving the loss of something important. It was how she felt. I went out last night. With the biker next door? With Cole, yes. Oh, he's Cole now. She smiled, pulling out a chair and plopping down, then folding her hands politely. He's always been Cole, Jill said, sipping her coffee but not really tasting it. And tomorrow he'll be that guy I once knew for about three days. He's leaving and he's not coming back. Liz winced, dropped her head a bit, and peered up into Jill's fallen face. I'm sorry, Jill. I know you tried not to get involved. I so didn't want you to get hurt. It's nobody's fault. Jill checked her phone for the time. The first kids would be arriving at any moment. I knew exactly what I was getting myself into. Will the pain at least be worth it? Liz raised an eyebrow. Jill thought for a moment. It was true she'd had the best time ever with Cole. Their first night together, the conversations, the shared meals, the bike ride through L.A. In just a few days, they'd smiled and laughed an awful lot. So, yes, she genuinely had a good time with a great guy. I could have loved him, she heard herself say. She stared into her coffee. Liz was quiet, but Jill didn't need confirmation that she was talking crazy. She already knew it. She'd only known Cole a few days, after all. Jill pulled herself together and looked up. I know that sounds crazy, and anyway, it's not going to happen. I can't fall in love with someone who's not here. She stood, downed the rest of her coffee, and placed a plate into the sink. She heard a car arriving outside and was about to head to the front door when Liz reached out and grabbed her hand. Honey, meeting someone you could love... That's not such a bad thing, is it? And maybe this doesn't have to be the end. It's better that it is. Why? Because you're afraid you'll end up like your dad? Jill felt a pang in her stomach at Liz's words. Funny how she hadn't thought of that, not recently. No, she'd been too busy simply enjoying Cole. But it made sense. Imagine how Cole would react if he knew about her medical history, both her cancer scare and her risk of developing Alzheimer's. It's a valid reason to avoid a relationship, Liz. What kind of person would knowingly do that to their partner? Make them think they'll have a lifetime together when chances are they won't. At least my father didn't know he was going to become demented at 40 years old. He had no idea he wouldn't know his own wife and daughter. It's hereditary, and I don't want to become anyone's burden. Liz let go of her hand and shook her head. It's hereditary, yes, but you only have a 50% chance that you carry the gene. You're letting the unknown future hold you back. Are you still on the fence about getting tested? If the news isn't good, at least you'll be better prepared to make life decisions. Logically, I know that, but emotionally... She shook her head. I'm not ready to face it, reality or not. Then you're not ready. You'll know when you are. Liz flashed her a big sister-type smile. Thanks. No problem. I'm much older and wiser than you. That's why you keep me around. The doorbell rang, and both Jill and Liz sprang to attention, Liz pulling out flour and baking powder while Jill headed for the door. No, Jill said over her shoulder with a smile. I keep you around because the kids say your pancakes come out way fluffier than mine. 
And because, unlike Cole, Liz was there for the long haul. Someone Jill could count on, love wholeheartedly. Someone who'd love her back. Chapter 12 Crossing the lawn to Cole's later that night, Jill recited, It was fun while it lasted, Jill, but he's not the one. Over and over. Her head was almost convinced, but her heart was having a harder time believing her words. Cole was so much more than a fun dalliance. He was a brave man who'd loved his mother, treated women well, owned his own company, and was looking forward to bigger, better things for himself. More importantly, she had fun with him, and he made her feel things. Wild, amazing, mind-blowing things she'd never felt before. And now she was supposed to just go on with her normal life as if they'd never met? Obviously, she had to. She wasn't going to be the clingy woman that made their parting awkward. When she arrived, she rang the doorbell and took deep, cleansing breaths. Cole opened the door with a huge but obviously strained smile plastered across his face. He wore a tight black t-shirt, his biker vest, and jeans. Hey there, he said. I hope you're hungry. He pulled her inside and toward the dining room. White boxes from her favorite Thai restaurant sat on the table along with a delicate porcelain service. Two tall candles stood lit in the middle. Oh, wow, this is amazing, Cole. I wanted to say thank you for all your help. You're certainly welcome. I've had fun helping you, she added with a smile. There was no escaping thoughts about the time they'd spent pleasing and teasing each other. He was obviously remembering the same things, too, given the light that had sparked in his eyes. Cole walked over to the table and pulled her chair back for her. Why, thank you. What a gentleman. She smiled, immediately loving the way she felt around him. However, once she sat down and he joined her, it hit her. Harder than she could have ever imagined. This was a goodbye dinner. Hold it together, Jill, she told herself. After a minute, she found her voice. Your meeting is tomorrow? 8 a.m. If we get the job, things will be crazy for a while. He took her plate and began serving her some fried rice. Jill nodded. She tried to hold back the storm forming behind her eyes, even looking down at the food to hide her face. So, how were the kids today? Cole asked. A nice, safe topic. They were good. You're still Stanley's hero, you know. He made a motorcycle out of clay today. I was going to take a picture of it to show you, but then he smashed it with his fist. She laughed not symbolic at all. She cleared her throat and looked up at him. Don't worry about packing. I'll stay until we finish. I can always come back later for any last odds and ends, he said slowly as if gauging her mood. Was that a hint he may return at a later date? Hope filled her for a moment, then died quickly when he spoke again. Still, if we can try to finish, that would be great, but... Only if you're up for it. I feel bad asking you to do more work. His sincere expression made her heart sink. No, I want to help, Cole. She gave him a weak smile. Feel free to take a rest if you can't keep up with me. He grinned. The heavy mood lifted, but not for long. They both picked at their food while trying to find lighter things to talk about. Anything but his mother, this house, or Cole leaving. Once they weren't pushing rice around their plates anymore, she cleared the dishes. When he still didn't move from the table, she said, We should probably get started. All right. He rose, tossing his paper napkin on the table. Where should we start? The last of the collectibles? Sure. She grabbed a box and they got to work. Unlike the day before, she didn't ask him questions or tease him. She was determined to be as efficient as possible, and it paid off. Within a couple of hours, they were done. Looking around the house full of furniture and boxes, a wave of melancholy rose into her throat. She wasn't surprised to be sad. Stella may not have been her mother, but the woman had acted motherly toward her, always making sure she was okay, always baking cookies for Jill's kids, always proudly talking about her son. 
Before she could change her mind, she went with her instincts by grabbing her keys and heading for the door. This is it, Jill. Just say goodbye. Tell him you'll stay in touch and get out of there. At the front door, she turned around and held out her hand. Well, Cole, it was wonderful meeting you. I'm so glad I was able to help you, and I do wish you the best of luck with all your endeavors. Cole stared at her, hands on his hips. So that's it? You sound like you just informed me you won't be hiring me. Jill sagged. Cole, don't make this difficult, please. How else am I supposed to say goodbye? With a hug, maybe? A long, sweet kiss? I don't know, is that stupid of me to think? He crossed his arms over his broad chest. That would only make things harder, Cole, and you know it. I should be going. I have to get things ready for the kids in the morning. She brought her hand down. If he wasn't going to take it, then this ending was turning out worse than expected. Jill. She opened the door but couldn't bring herself to step outside. She just stood there, wanting to cry. She'd tried to be distant and failed, and she'd tried to let him into her heart and failed. Would you just listen to me, please? His voice grew husky. Jill, you've been distant ever since I got the phone call about leaving tomorrow. Jill whirled around. Was I supposed to jump for joy? Do cartwheels? You tell me, Cole. How should I have reacted? How should I have felt knowing that in less than 24 hours the man who's made me laugh and cry, who's filled my soul, would be leaving? I mean, I got into this knowing you'd be taking off. I'd prepared myself, but even so, it hurts. His eyes flared at her words. Something in his face softened, relieved. Stay. So you can squeeze one more fun time out of me before you go, is that it? She knew she was being difficult and unreasonable, but she just couldn't see the good in dragging this out any further. The pressure behind her eyes was too much and her hands flew to her face to cover up her tears. She felt his soft, warm hands covering hers. Gently, he pulled her hands away, exposing her mess of a face. He lifted one of her hands to his mouth and kissed her knuckles. Please stay. They stood still for a moment, looking into each other's eyes, until he pulled her close to kiss her. It felt like a hello and goodbye mixed together, slow and sweet, savoring. Maybe she'd never learn. Maybe this was life, these moments of heartache, and she had to live them whether she liked it or not. Ignoring them was even more difficult. She slid her hands up his side and broad back, bringing them closer together as he enveloped her in his arms. Chapter 13 Cole's alarm tone went off just as the sun began streaming in through the blinds. His eyes opened slightly and he ran his hand across the bed. It was empty. Jill? He shot up in bed and looked around in the early morning light. Was she in the bathroom, or had she already... left? Her clothes had been picked off the floor. He checked the bathroom, then the kitchen and living room. No sign of her. She was gone. He let out a slow, shaky breath, unsure what his heart was feeling. He'd only known her a few days. How was it possible for one woman to entrench herself so deeply inside him? He tried reminding himself what he knew was smart. Don't get attached to anyone. You don't want responsibility that will tie you down just when you have the chance to experience complete freedom again. But one nagging fact remained. He wanted freedom, but he also wanted Jill. But they lived in different worlds with different lifestyles. She was completely dedicated to her daycare and her business partner. So Cole doubted she'd consider relocating. Why would she, for him, anyway? No, she'd done the smart thing and cut him loose. Good girl, Jill. Several hours later, he took one last lingering look around the empty house, then closed the front door with a heavy heart. I'll miss you, Mom. A small sense of accomplishment comforted him. He'd done it. He'd come here and taken care of things, with Jill's help. And he was going to miss her, too. The movers picked up the last of the boxes Cole had set outside for them. 
He shook his keys, ready to get his Harley, when he saw Jill watering some potted plants on her front stoop. His heart jumped. Good morning. She stiffened and shot him a dim smile. You off? she asked politely. So this was how she was going to handle things, pretending that his leaving meant nothing, that their time together had already been forgotten. I'm on my way out, he said, gesturing to the moving truck. But I wanted to say thank you for everything. As I've said before, it was my pleasure. Jill. He sighed. He ran a hand through his hair and crossed their lawns, stopping within several feet of her. You have no idea how much you help me. That wasn't exactly what he wanted to tell her, but it was a start. Still, nothing more came out, and they both stood there in awkward silence, taking in each other's miserable looks. Finally, Jill put down her watering can and stepped toward him. He met her halfway and wrapped his arms around her, pulling her close to inhale her unique and lovely scent. He held her tightly, not wanting to let go. She didn't step back either. Listen, she said into his neck. I know you're going to be busy starting the new office in San Francisco, but maybe when you have free time, we could still see each other. Cole stiffened. Of course he wanted to see her again, and plenty of people had long-distance relationships. If others could make it work, why couldn't they? Yet something nagged at him, insisting it wouldn't be wise. She'd end up wanting more, as she should, because she deserved the best. But he wouldn't be able to give her what she needed. No, she deserved a man who would make her the center of his universe. A man who wouldn't leave her for a career or to chase a rogue wind down an extended blacktop. He couldn't, would not, do that to her. She would end up resenting him forever. Jill loosened her hold on him and leaned back to gauge his response to that. He shook his head. Jill, I want to spend more time with you. Of course I do. It's just... I'm going to be busy, too busy to give you the time and attention you deserve. You understand that, don't you? Behind them, a car door shut, followed by the call of a young boy. Cole glanced up to see Stanley running up the path while his father stood on the other side of the car, staring at them over the roof. Right, Jill nodded, her words suddenly terse. Of course, you're right. She took several swift steps away from him. Well, take care, Cole. His heart clenched as he watched her take Stanley's hand and walk toward the house without even glancing back. He could do nothing, say nothing, could only watch her head inside and close the door behind her. Once inside, Jill frantically blinked back tears, forcing a cheerful note into her voice as she spoke with Stanley. Then someone knocked on her door. Cole, she thought, her heart skipping with endless possibilities. Had he changed his mind? Don't be a fool, Jill, she told herself. She'd put herself out there, raised a question in hopes that he might consider it, and he'd shot her down, letting her know exactly where she stood with him. She'd been a bit of fun, someone who'd helped him through a difficult time, but now he was returning to his real life, a life that didn't include her. When she looked through the peephole, she saw Jason, Stanley's father, she pasted on a polite smile before opening the door. Good morning, Jason said, peering in. Hi, did Stanley forget something? He took a step into the house, and instinctively she took one back. I was wondering if maybe you'd like to have dinner with me sometime, if you'd like to go on a date, he said. She glanced at Stanley, who was sitting at the mini table drawing. I'm sorry, Jason, she said finally, but I'm seeing someone. At least I was until a few hours ago. Jason frowned. Is it the guy next door? The motorcycle guy that Stanley goes on about? I'm sorry, but I'm not comfortable discussing my personal life. Thank you for the invitation, but Stanley and I should probably prepare for the other kids to arrive now. Instead of leaving, he continued to stare at her, which made her heart race. Nervously, she licked her lips, cursing when Jason's gaze followed the movement. Yeah. Okay, Jason finally said. I'll see you later. Sounds good, she turned away and closed the door. Hey, Squirt, you ready for some pancakes? She said to Stanley just as the doorbell rang again. 
This time it was Anaya and her mother. The day was a whirlwind of activity, and Jill kept busy enough that she kept her thoughts about Cole to a minimum. Later, after all the children were gone, Liz took her hand and led her to the sofa. Tell me, she said gently. Jill smiled sadly. He's gone, for good. He's starting a new job here in L.A., then moving forward with his plans to move to San Francisco. He could come back, you two could... Her words trailed off. Jill shook her head and pressed her lips together, doing her best not to cry, but her expression crumpled and tears filled her eyes. Oh, honey, I'm sorry, Liz said, giving Jill a hug and patting her back. Jill hugged her friend back tightly for several seconds, then pulled back with a sigh. He was honest with me from the start. I can't blame him. Still sucks, still hurts, and still makes me want to fill his bike's gas tank with sugar. Jill laughed. Right. She folded and unfolded and refolded a napkin in her hand, thinking about where she'd go from here. So what now? Liz asked, as if reading her mind. Jill took a deep breath. Movie tonight? Some girl time is exactly what I need. Liz smiled. Of course, honey, my treat. Hours later, the movie about an alien spaceship found in a Florida suburb worked to take her mind off her troubles, and Jill and Liz ended the night with a drink at a different bar from where her troubles began in the first place. Still, just the atmosphere was enough to dredge the memories back up again. Since she was obviously poor company, she ended the night early and let Liz go home. But Jill wasn't ready to do the same, and she needed a few things from the store anyway. An hour later, mission almost accomplished, Jill headed home. After leaving her groceries in the kitchen, she headed straight to her bedroom, then her bathroom, flicked the light on, and... Someone shoved her hard. Crying out, she flew sideways, slamming into the bathroom counter, bouncing off and hitting the floor sideways. Piercing pain shot through her face and arm. The room spun. She tried to get her bearings, tried to defend herself and scoot away from the door. Something crashed off a shelf and a door slammed. She held her breath and listened for what seemed like years. When it was obvious her intruder was gone, she managed to pull her cell phone out and dial 911 with shaky fingers. Even now, he was all she could think about. More than the police, more than anything, she wanted one person at her side. Cole. Chapter 14 After leaving his mom's house and Jill behind, Cole spent the day at home researching Senator Taylor and the Staples Center layout. He could have gone into the office, but he knew the memories of Jill's would haunt him. And he wasn't quite ready for that yet. Didn't matter. Even in his own apartment, where Jill had never been, thoughts of her plagued him. He'd even started to see her figure and face in his favorite painting and would stare at it for minutes on end like some lovesick fool. It was propped against a wall, not even hung up yet. Bright colors splattered out from the center where a young woman leaned over a little table, her dark hair sweeping forward to cover her face. Mysterious, seductive in an innocent way. Like Jill, when he left for his 8 a.m. meeting with the senator the next morning, Cole was thinking of Jill yet again. Riding his bike through the city, he pictured having Jill with him, perched on the back. She'd loved riding on his bike. He could still hear her happy squeals when he took the corners hard and sharp. But he needed to stop thinking about her, get his head in the game again, score this job, and move forward with starting up the business in San Francisco. During the process, he'd arranged to take time off for the ride home. For the first time since leaving Jill, he felt a tinge of interest in something outside of her. Riding the blacktop for weeks with his friends, with no responsibilities or difficult decisions to make, would be incredible. He needed something to look forward to. He parked his bike in a garage and walked two blocks to the Hilton on Grand Avenue. 
When he entered the lobby, a woman in a black dress and heels paused on her way toward the bar and gave him an up-and-down look that took in his business suit. She raised an appreciative eyebrow and stopped, standing straight in his path. She was slender, with wavy, long, dark hair that reminded him of Jill's. A businesswoman, and a successful one if he were to guess by the designer dress and shoes. Cole slowed his pace. She was waiting for a sign, a subtle smile or nod. But he continued walking past her. Another woman didn't interest him. All he'd do was compare her to Jill anyway, and that knowledge made him come to an abrupt halt. He found himself rethinking his stance about not seeing Jill. Again. Maybe he'd made a mistake. Maybe... He shook his head. Cut it out, Cole. Business. Keep your mind on business. A simple life, attachment-free. Who knew what kind of adventures awaited him in San Francisco and beyond? He wanted to explore the world, feel the rush of the wind against his face as he rode his bike on the open road. That was what he'd wanted his whole life, and he finally had the opportunity to do it. If he tried to compromise for Jill, he'd only end up disappointing her. Firming his jaw along with his resolve, he found the elevator and took it up to the top floor. He located the penthouse, tapping on the door. A few seconds later, Cole was escorted inside to wait in the living area, where he remained standing. Well, good morning. Cole looked up to see a sharply dressed, very fit, middle-aged man with perfectly coiffed silver hair standing in the doorway of the bedroom. Good morning, I'm Cole Novak. He extended his hand. The man strolled forward and shook hands with him. Leonard Taylor, I'm pleased to meet you, Cole. I've heard great things about you. Thank you, sir. I'm pleased to meet you, too. Leonard is fine, while it's just the two of us. Yes, sir, Cole said. Senator Taylor grinned. At least the guy had a sense of humor. Cole liked him, and for the next half hour, they discussed the job. At one point, Taylor offered to order up breakfast, and Cole politely declined. You sure? A man needs his protein. From the looks of you, you'll work it off before the week is over. Cole grinned. Yes, sir. You look like you're no stranger to the gym yourself. I was a bit of a gym rat as a young man. Now I prefer my morning runs when I'm at home. Is your home in Sacramento? Cole asked. My primary home is there. I have one in Orange County as well. I normally stay there when I'm in town, but it's going through some renovations now, so it wasn't ready for me. I grew up in O.C. I'm a SoCal boy at heart. Dodgers fan, USC alumnus, Lakers fan, the whole nine yards. I'm right there with you, Cole said, nodding. You grew up here too? The senator asked him. Yes, sir, Cole said. In Glendale, not Orange, he clarified. Do you still have family in L.A.? No, sir, Cole said. Not even a girl. The senator paused and shook his head. I guess that's a little personal for the first day, but the look on your face says it all. What look, Cole thought, not about to discuss Jill with a stranger no matter how much Cole liked him. Forgive me, I'm just feeling nostalgic today. I had an amazing woman in my life at one time. Two of them, actually. One I lost to divorce, the other to circumstance, and my own cowardice. I don't know why I'm telling you that, he added with a bittersweet laugh. The experience taught me a lesson, albeit a little late. Follow your heart. The tangent the man had taken seemed a little unusual to call as did the way he stared expectantly at Cole, as if he really wanted Cole to hear his message and apply it. If Cole didn't know better, he'd think the senator was talking to him about Jill specifically, but that was impossible. Besides, following one's heart had to be tempered by logic, and careful weighing of the risks and benefits to all persons involved, not just himself. Right, smart words, sir. Cole stood. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. If you decide Frontline is right for the job, already have. The senator smiled. I'd love to work with you, Cole. 
Cole smiled, and though he should have felt a lot happier than he did, he couldn't bring himself to completely feel it. In the lobby, Cole's phone buzzed. He took a quick glance at the screen and recoiled when he saw Jill's number. He immediately answered. Jill? This is Liz, said a woman, Jill's partner, he remembered. Jill's in the hospital. Someone broke into the daycare, into her house. It took him a moment to calm the blinding rage filling his mind and body. After getting as much information from Liz as he could, he quickly excused himself from the meeting and ran to his bike. When he sped away, it was with his mind on one thing, getting to Jill. Chapter 15 You did what? Jill croaked, aghast. Why did you call Cole? Her body hurt all over, but now a different kind of pain jabbed into her heart. Jill, he cares about you, Liz said. He wanted to come. What? He's coming here to the hospital? Jill cried. She felt bad. She most likely looked bad. She hadn't seen herself in the mirror yet, but her head throbbed even with the pain meds they'd given her. It had been a very long night. She'd already gone through a scan for her head and x-rays on her arm. Her arm was badly bruised, but not broken. She'd had a mild concussion, however, they'd had her stay overnight for observation. Were you able to call all the kids' parents? Jill asked Liz. Yes, I didn't tell them what happened, just that we were going to have to close today due to an emergency. Jill sighed and closed her eyes, wanting to run from everything. Normally, she dealt with issues head-on, but this? She felt violated. Invaded. And as much as she didn't want to admit it, scared. She didn't feel safe in her own home anymore. That was too bad. She'd built a happy life in that house, baked cookies, taught the kids, played with them, even made love with Cole. She started to drift off. Jill? Liz's voice sounded strange, a little different. She turned toward Liz's voice, and in the low light of the room, she saw a very tall, broad figure dressed in a suit. At first she thought she was dreaming, but Cole really was standing at the end of the bed, staring at her in disbelief. Liz quietly left the room. You didn't have to come, Jill whispered. Shaking his head, he moved closer and pulled in a chair to sit by her bed. Of course I did, he said. I wanted to come. But what about your meeting? I was done by the time I got Liz's call. Gently, he touched the unhurt side of her face while looking over the other side. It looks worse than it is. I want to kill whoever did this, he mumbled, the hand on his lap bawling into a fist. Cole, it's just a few bruises. It's not just bruises. That was your home, your safety, your business. I shouldn't have left. He shook his head and turned his face away. What do you mean? How can you possibly be feeling guilty for this? He lifted her hand, pressing a single kiss on each knuckle, then her entire hand to his mouth. I'm just, I'm so sorry you got hurt. She sucked in a quick, shaky breath. Cole. Shh, it's okay. He soothed her hair back from her face. The gesture made her close her eyes. Sleep pulled at her again. It's okay, Jill. You can rest. Don't worry about a thing. I'm here, and I'm not going anywhere. Cole watched Jill's facial muscles relax. He listened to her breathing even out. He held on to her hand, wishing he could kiss away her injuries. She looked so beautiful in sleep, but it pained him to see the purple bruises blooming up one side of her face. Her left eye was black and swollen, making his stomach flip over. Her left arm was in a sling to keep her from moving it. Jill looked like a porcelain doll, one he'd break if he so much as bumped into her. Her hand felt so delicate in his. How could someone do this? Rage filled him, and he had to take deep, even breaths to control it. His phone buzzed. He looked down, seeing it was Luke calling. Hello? He said softly. Hey, man. Luke jumped right in. Is Jill okay? 
After getting Liz's call earlier, Cole had called Luke about the break-in, but at the time he hadn't known much. Hang on just a sec, Cole said, leaving the room so he wouldn't disturb Jill's sleep. She doesn't have a severe concussion or any broken bones, but she's black and blue. I'm sorry, man. Any leads? No, but there was a daycare dad who seemed interested in her. I'm going to check it out. And Luke? Yeah, buddy. I'm not leaving her side until I know she's safe, Cole said. There was the buzz of silence over the line before Luke said, I'll ask the senator if he'll accept another body for the job since you're out of commission at the moment. Thanks. You okay, man? I... I don't know. Cole paced to the corner, fifteen feet away and back. It's hard to handle. I should have done something to prevent this. Cole, you didn't know. If you had, there's no way you would have left her. True, but same as with his mom, he hadn't been there when Jill needed him most. Yeah, well, I'm sticking close to Jill now. I don't want her alone if there's even the slightest chance that someone out there might come back to hurt her. Well, don't worry about things back here. We've got everything under control. Take as much time there as you need, okay? Thanks, man. Cole said goodbye and went back to Jill's bedside. Liz came into the room right behind him, and they nodded to each other. Liz sat down on the other side of the bed. Seems like we're all feeling guilty about this, she said quietly. He nodded, glad to have someone understand. I didn't mean to, but I heard part of your conversation. You're going to stay with her? Yes. We're also going to be upgrading security on the house, doing some investigation to make sure you'll all be safe before opening your door again. Liz smiled slightly. What? Cole asked, confused by her expression. You said we. We're going to upgrade security. Are you and Jill a we now? He remained silent, not sure how to respond. Biting her lip, Liz looked torn. She really cares about you, you know. It hurt her when you left. Cole clenched his jaw. It hurt me to leave. I'm not in the best place right now. I'm confused about what's right for both of us long term. But I'm not confused about what's right for us at this moment. I'm not leaving her until I know she and you are going to be safe. Liz searched his face for a moment before nodding. Okay. He watched her leave, then sat at Jill's bedside again. She rested peacefully, though at some points she twitched and moaned. Hey, shh, it's all right. I'm here. Cole took her hand, watching her sleep until she stirred again half an hour later. When her eyes opened, he bent close and whispered, Morning. Morning? Well, it's afternoon, I guess. He tried for a light laugh to cheer her up. She barely shifted her swollen mouth into something resembling a smile. Cole, I'm so sorry I wasn't here. It's not your fault, she said, closing her eyes. The medicine still making her drowsy. It felt like his fault, though. Protecting people was his job. Protecting Jill, far more than that. Chapter 16 Jill was in the process of being discharged when Cole told her she shouldn't go home. It's not safe to return to your house, not until we have answers. What if it wasn't a random break-in? What if someone is watching the house or stalking you? He reached for her hand. I'm not trying to scare you, Jill, but I want you to come back with me. Back to Stellis, you mean? She couldn't do that. They were over. Yes, he'd come to the hospital, but she couldn't let him pause his life to take care of her out of pity or a false sense of responsibility. Still, the depth of concern and care in his eyes was real. Would he want to stick around after she'd recovered? Would this be like pulling a band-aid off slowly instead of all at once? They'd already yanked the band-aid off once, but the second time could be even more painful. I'll take you back to my place. You can rest while I get some guys to update the security at your place. How much will that cost? You don't need to worry about that. Of course she did. I'm going to pay you for whatever security you put in, Cole. I won't argue about that. With a sigh, Cole nodded. You can reimburse me for the material. Labor is free. When she opened her mouth to argue, he placed a gentle finger against her lips. 
I won't argue about that, Jill. When he dropped his finger, she nodded, but his heated touch had affected her. Fine, but let's not fool ourselves about why you're really here, Cole. We ended whatever was personal between us yesterday. This is about you wanting to protect me, an instinct you have. And while those instincts are lovely, I don't want either of us getting confused about what's going on here. Cole gave her a side glance. Okay, I'll give you that. I want to protect you. But it's more than just that. I don't know exactly what I feel for you, Jill. I don't know what I should do about it. But I do know I care about you. A lot. And I shouldn't have walked away like I did. Listen to me. You can't take care of me just because you feel guilty. It'll only draw things out longer, Cole. She tried to keep her composure. It was hard enough to have a serious talk like this in a hospital gown. She didn't want to start crying, too. Is that what you think? He sat up straighter. I feel guilty, so I'm trying to make myself feel better. Aren't you? Her volume went up just a notch. No, I made a mistake by walking away. He ran a hand through his hair. We've only known each other a week. I was so determined to run from any potential commitment, but we don't even know if that's what either of us will want. I can't make promises, but why should we ignore the attraction between us? You were brave enough to see the other option, to ask if we could still see each other. Is there a part of you that still wants that? In her heart, she knew the answer was both no and yes. She didn't want to see him for a while to test things out. She already knew what she really wanted. A long future with Cole. It would be foolish for her to try and convince herself otherwise. Because Cole hadn't come to the same conclusion yet, and he might never do so. I don't know, Cole. She smashed her tired eyes against the palms of her hands. It's okay. We'll make it okay. Just let me take care of you right now. No pressure. No expectations. Cole slid an arm under her shoulders and gently held her. Okay, she finally whispered. I'll stay at your place. This feels odd. Jill looked at Cole, jammed in the driver's seat of her little two-door, which Liz had left in the hospital parking lot for them. His cologne floated around her, making her swoon a bit. Leaving with me? He asked. No, sitting in the passenger seat of my own car. They shared a laugh. Cole drove them through a flashy neighborhood to a tall but sleek building that didn't look anything like the houses back in the suburbs. He slung her smaller bag over his shoulder. She felt bare, not carrying anything but her small purse, but appreciated his help. They took the elevator up to his floor. Welcome to my home. Cole swung the door open and gestured for Jill to step inside. Definitely a man's home, it was an open space with a weight set taking up the main part of the room and not much else for furniture. A black leather couch sat against one wall facing a large flat-screen TV. Across from that was a small kitchen. She moved further into the space, looking around and wondering if this felt like home to him. The one decoration was a painting resting against the wall. It wasn't even hung up. Of a dark-haired woman leaning over a cafe table. Startled, Jill realized who it looked like. I saw that in a street fair a few years ago and had to have it, he explained. I didn't know why. It definitely looked like her. Did he see it? Are you okay? He asked. Do you need a pain pill? She shook her head. Her head spun a bit, but the ache that had started earlier was blissfully gone. Jill? Cole craned his neck to look at her. I'm just sleepy, she said, feeling weak all of a sudden. The room began to swirl. He lifted her gently in his arms and carried her through a doorway into his bedroom. She came down on a soft pillow top, a perfectly fluffy bed. The light flicked off and she was falling. But I wanted more time with him. To talk. Look at him. Hold him. Breathe in all that was coal. And cherish him for as long as she could. Before it was too late. Chapter 17 while Jill slept, Cole made some calls to get her house cleaned up and her security upgraded. 
A couple of hours passed, and when she finally emerged from his bedroom, hair ruffled, he fixed her a late breakfast. He noted her black eye was starting to fade. It still pained him to see her hurt, but he smiled. You look better already. She stifled a yawn. I didn't mean to kick you out of your bed, but it's amazing what some sleep in a handsome man's bed can do for a girl's constitution. He chuckled. When you're feeling better, maybe we can explore what other things we can do to make you feel better. She didn't brush away his comment, didn't say no, only blushed, looking so cute he wanted to grab her up in his arms. He forced himself to turn back to the meal he'd been preparing, dishing out two plates of scrambled eggs, fresh peach slices, and buttered toast. This smells beyond amazing, thanks for cooking, she said. They sat down to eat while he poured them coffee. Jill lifted her mug to inhale the strong aroma, then took a sip. Mmm, this is good too. All of this is really nice, but am I keeping you from work? I took the rest of the day off. After their food was gone and they drank several cups of coffee over conversation, Jill said, Would it be okay if I... if I took a shower? Of course. I'll show you where everything's at. Cole headed to the bathroom with Jill trailing behind him. He opened a cabinet and she watched him pull out everything a person could possibly want for their shower. Towel, soap, shaving cream, razors. Was he trying to tell her something? She laughed and when he glanced at her, she just gently shook her head. I might need help, she said timidly. A blush rose into her cheeks. I mean, getting my shirt off. And why does that embarrass you? A small smile tugged on one side of his mouth. He opened the shower and turned on the water to warm up. I'm happy to help. I suppose I can close my eyes if you want. You don't have to do that. I just... It's just a little embarrassing to need help. It didn't make sense after everything they had shared, but this felt much more personal. Don't be. He stood in front of her and leaned close to gently kiss her lips before lifting her t-shirt ever so carefully up and over her arms. She hadn't been expecting the kiss, but then again, she hadn't been expecting anything that had to do with Cole. The way he entered her life or the way he surprised her at the hospital. She knew she was covered in bruises, but he didn't flinch or stare. Cole acted as if everything was normal, except for treating her with tender care. She appreciated that. A few times in the hospital, a sudden movement had made her flinch. Now, with Cole, she felt safe. Chapter 18 The next day, Jill and Cole spent a lazy morning together. After taking her to lunch at a nearby bistro, he told her he needed to leave for a few hours to see to her new security system. Now, standing by the door, she watched Cole get ready to leave. Make yourself at home, and call me if you need anything. Anything, Jill. Cole lingered, patting his pockets and double-checking everything. I'll be fine. I'll get some rest, listen to some music, give Liz a call. She waved her hand around. I'll keep myself occupied, okay? If I really get bored, I'll bench press. What? He caught her stifling a giggle. Oh, funny. He leaned over for what looked like a quick peck, but he kissed her slowly and softly. Finally, he pulled back, laying several more kisses on her forehead and face, covering the bruises. It almost brought tears to her eyes, but she wanted to stay upbeat to see him off. You better get going, mister. She didn't want him to be late because of her. Fine, but I'd much rather stay. I get it. You look pretty great in that leather jacket, she said, eyeing him up and down as he opened the door. Maybe I'll let you take it off later on. He flashed one last grin before shutting the door behind him. This domestic life wasn't so bad, she thought with a mischievous chuckle. She could get used to it. Though she felt stupid for doing so, she double-checked the lock. Now that she was alone, it was hard to push away her anxiety. A few times she startled at small sounds, and other times she jumped like someone was about to tackle her. But in Cole's apartment she felt safe, and she was determined not to let one criminal make her feel otherwise. 
She refreshed her coffee and sat down to think. After Cole had been so gentle and understanding last night, she'd spent hours lying awake in his arms. The conclusion she'd come to both thrilled and scared her. Cole was right. They couldn't know what the future held. What mattered was right now, and right now she was going to give them a chance. To do that, she had to tell him the truth about her health, that she might be a burden some day. She'd have to tell him about her cancer scare and her father's early-onset Alzheimer's. And she had to tell him the worst part, that she had a 50% chance of inheriting the same gene. Or maybe she didn't, she thought, suddenly chickening out. Maybe she should take Liz's advice and get tested first. She just wasn't sure. Jill poured herself a glass of orange juice and was leaning against the counter, browsing the internet on her phone, searching for genetic counselors when she accidentally bumped the glass over. She quickly reached for some paper towels to clean it up. As she did, she saw what appeared to be an envelope torn in half. It was addressed to Cole, the handwriting a masculine slash. She left it where it was. After all, her parents had not taught her to be a snoop, but her imagination went wild. Vaguely, she remembered Cole's mom mentioning that his father wasn't part of their lives, that he'd sent Cole a letter every year for the past five years, but Cole had never opened them. He hadn't wanted to know who his father was, not after he'd abandoned them for over two decades of his life. Was this one of those letters? She took a peek at the timestamp and saw it was a week after Stella died. Cole had torn it up. And now, here it was. And there she was, fingers and eyes itching to touch it. While Cole was gone, Jill watched some mindless TV before making several calls. First to Liz to make sure the daycare schedule had been arranged. They were going to open again in a few days. She checked in with police, but they still had no suspects in the break-in of her home. She hung up, set her cell phone on the counter, and thought about taking a nap. After all, she was emotionally drained, as well as physically, but then she saw she had two voice messages. First, Cole's smooth voice came on the line. Hey, sweetie, just seeing how it's going, and if you need anything, looks like you're on the phone. Hope you're relaxing. She could hear the smile in his voice. After he'd called her Darlin that one time and she hadn't liked it, she'd noticed he'd taken care not to use casual endearments with her. But the way he'd just called her Sweetie sounded genuine, like it was an endearment reserved for her alone. She repeated the message just so she could hear it again and again, loving the deep, rich tones in his masculine voice. The next message surprised her. It was Jason, Stanley's father. Hello, um, Jill. This is Jason, Stanley's dad. I just wanted to say I'm really sorry to hear about the break-in at the daycare. And Stanley misses you. He keeps asking how you're doing and is looking forward to the daycare opening again. I miss you too, and I hope you'll reconsider going out to dinner with me sometime. Take care. Jill replayed that one several times, too, hearing the nervous inflections in the man's voice. She had to admit she was a little flabbergasted. He was persistent, she had to give him that, but she didn't want his misguided feelings for her to get in the way of her relationship with Stanley. No sooner did she have the thought than the front door opened and Cole entered, carrying several grocery bags. You took your sling off. His tone was both surprised and worried. Jill glanced down and shrugged. My arm's not hurting. I can move it as long as I'm careful. That sling was getting really annoying. I'll bet. Cole set the bags down on the counter and took her in his arms, giving her a sweet kiss. The security system has been installed. You can open the daycare again any time, but I'd give it a few days. See if the police come up with any more leads about the break-in. Cole, I can't thank you enough. She peeked at the groceries and spied fresh fish and asparagus. Maybe I can cook you dinner to start with? I'm cooking tonight. You rest. 
But that's all I've been doing, resting. Can I at least help? Please? He shook his head. I didn't do a very good job resisting you the last time you said please to me like that. She pouted and gave him puppy dog eyes. I promise to use my power wisely. I'd appreciate that. She started on a salad while he laid the fish out in a dish to bake. He explained the security code and how everything worked. He'd also written it down for her. Jill tucked it away in her purse to remember later, though she was sure he'd show her himself. Soon, he had the seasoned fish in the oven, and he did the same with the asparagus using a different seasoning and putting that in the oven a few minutes later. Done with the salad, Jill came up behind him and slipped her arms around his waist, leaning her face against his back. So, is this the dinner you cook when you have a girl over? Hmm? Most men have one fancy dinner they can cook to impress girls, she said in a teasing tone. Great idea, but no, I haven't cooked for a woman before. She flared her eyes and gaped. Never? He was completely serious. Never. Jill, I don't think you realize this, but spending time with you is special. Having you here means a lot to me. I don't do this with everyone. Anyone. After the delicious dinner, Cole took all the dishes to the sink, grabbed his keys, and took her by the hand. Let's leave the dishes for when we get back. Where are we going? I thought if you're feeling good, we could go for a ride to the beach. She immediately clapped her hands with excitement. On the bike? He winked. Is there any other way? After making sure Jill's arm felt well enough that she could hold on to him once they got going, they took off. Cole felt an odd mixture of peace and excitement vibrating through him. Jill squealed and laughed in pleasure, clearly loving the way he tilted through the curves. It felt wild and free, one of those moments when everything in life was just right, when he wanted to stop and frame it. Not just because they were on the bike and open road heading toward the sunset, but because of Jill. They reached a more secluded entrance to the beach and he parked the bike sideways so they could stare out at the ocean and setting sun. When he turned the engine off, he unbuckled his helmet and said, I love that feeling, like I'm one with the wind. It's like anything and everything can happen and everything's all right. I know what you mean. I felt like we were leaving life behind. It's just us, the bike, and the rise and fall of the pavement. He turned to look at her, his mouth partly agape and his eyes wide open. More open than ever. She got it. She got him. Cole was amazed to see red and orange rays reflecting in Jill's green eyes as she gazed at him. The rest of her skin was washed in warm, yellow light, and she looked like an angel. His raven-haired angel. Everything in the atmosphere felt soft around them. Maybe it was the lighting, or his mood, or just that it was a perfect evening by a gentle ocean breeze tickling his skin. Life didn't get any better than sharing it with Jill. He stared at her for way too long, but he couldn't look away. She was absolutely perfect. She searched his eyes for a few seconds, smiling, searching for words. When she did speak, it was just to whisper his name as she reached to touch his face. He lowered his head to kiss her. It was amazing. Chapter 19 Hours later, lying in Cole's bed in his apartment, Jill propped herself up on an elbow and looked at him like something might be on her mind. What is it? He traced a finger down her arm. I spilled some juice today, and when I went to get some paper towels, I saw an envelope on the counter. It had... it had been torn in half. It was just there. I didn't mean to violate your privacy. It's okay, he said. It's just a letter from my birth father. I figured. He looked at her in surprise. Then realization swept through him. My mom told you about him, didn't she? She nodded, giving him a sad smile. She told me about the letters. It was another regret, something she felt guilty about, that you never had a father. I didn't need a father. I had her. She was enough. 
Yes, but she knew when she passed, things would be different. He shook his head. She was worried. I get that. She wanted to know I'd have someone. But I just... I just couldn't let her tell me who he was. I didn't want to know. That wasn't always the case. When I was growing up, I desperately wanted to know. I had all these big ideas about him. I put him way up on a pedestal. Cole paused in thought. What happened? What changed? I got used to not knowing. And when my mom wanted to tell me, I couldn't handle it. In a way, I thought it would be betraying her. Like she'd die knowing she'd been replaced somehow. No way I'd ever do that to her after everything she did for me. Jill touched his hand. Cole, I don't think she would have felt that way. You knew her much better, of course, but she admired you, loved you. She just wanted you to be happy. I was happy. I am happy, he said, staring into her eyes. Happier than I've been in a long time, maybe ever. He stroked her arm again. What you and I have? Right here? Right now? I want more of it. I want to spend more time with you and see what we can be. He knew it was worth putting off working in San Francisco or riding cross-country to spend time with her. He watched her eyes widen. Jill, I don't know what will happen, but I'm hoping for forever. That's worth taking a risk on, don't you agree? Jill was so touched that tears stung her eyes. She fought them off, wanting to keep her head and think clearly. If she meant that much to him, if he really wanted a shot at forever, maybe they could find a compromise, build a life together, but make sure it was balanced so he wouldn't resent her. She decided to take a chance and tell him about her deepest fear. He had opened up and shared with her. She had to do it too. I... I do agree but I don't want to be a burden to you, she said, tears on the edges of her eyes. How could you ever be a burden? He reached over to stroke her face. You've done nothing but enhance my life. She took his hand in hers. I've been meaning to tell you something. She took a big breath and let it out slowly. I never told you how I met your mom. We met during chemo. He stared at her for a moment almost like he didn't believe her. Then he sucked in a breath and she dropped her gaze, afraid of what his expression would reveal. We underwent treatment at the same time. Mine wasn't as serious, but it shook me up bad, Cole. It was dead silent, but only for a few seconds. Why didn't you tell me that before? His voice had a slight edge, like he didn't want her to see that he was angry. His words, however, said it all. He was mad. I was afraid. Well, first it was just too private, and... I mean, we had a one-night stand. I didn't think you needed to know. We weren't going to stay together. There wasn't a reason to tell you, but now... He slid his hand out of hers. Wow, that's something. I'm sorry, Cole, but like I said, there was no reason to tell you before. And I mean, we've only known each other a week. She crossed her arms defensively. I'm sure there's lots of things about you I don't know, she ventured. He glanced up for a second, as though he'd been lost in his thoughts. Or emotions? Was he so angry he couldn't talk? All right, he finally said. I can see that. But you said it wasn't as big a deal for you. Does that mean you're okay? As far as we know, I'm fine. We caught it early. It's gone. There's no guarantees, of course, but... He blew out a deep breath. Okay. Good. I'm glad you're okay. He tried to pull her in close, but she shook her head. Wait, Cole, that's not all. I might as well get it all out there. My father had early-onset Alzheimer's disease. I could have the gene for it, too. I'm going to get tested. At least I'm considering it. It's scary, and part of me doesn't want to know. Cole's eyes resembled a frightened deer, and his hands shook as he suddenly ran both hands through his hair. How could you not tell me this until now? I was afraid to, and up to now we've kept an invisible wall between us. Neither of us was willing to take a risk at forever. But what you just said, I was hoping. Have you changed your mind? She sucked in breath when he failed to answer right away. 
He saw her fallen expression and shook his head. Don't look at me like that. I still care for you. I still want to be with you. But you're no longer sure if the risk is worth it? She whispered. Yes. No. He dragged his hands through his hair again, his face not just conflicted, but agonized. You have to understand, Jill. My mother's been sick on and off since I was sixteen. I've lived over a decade, watching her bounce between health and illness and the fact that I couldn't save her. I just don't know if I can handle that again. I don't know if I'm strong enough. I understand, she said, even as she felt her heart breaking. It's what she'd known all along. She was a burden, a ticking bomb. What man would ever want to be saddled with her? I'm saying things all wrong. You've just taken me by surprise, that's all, but... Before he could continue, though, his phone buzzed and he glanced at the screen. I'm sorry, it's Luke and he started on the tailor job today. I need to take this. Can I have some time? She took a deep, shallow breath and raised her chin. Of course, Cole. Take all the time you need. Once he disappeared, Jill dropped her head into her hands. She'd known this would be difficult. He had watched his mother wither away while he could do nothing to protect her, nothing to save her. And now he was imagining being tied down to Jill, too. This was his worst nightmare coming true. She could hear his voice on the phone outside getting farther and farther away. Was he leaving for a while? Had he just ruined everything? Tears welled in her eyes. She couldn't contain the pain. The tears spilled over and she gasped for breath, her body shaking as she tried to hold it in. But she couldn't. She just let it out, crying like she hadn't in years, unable to erase the look on his face when she gave him the news. She cried and cried, and he wasn't there to comfort her. After talking to Luke and giving him his opinion on a matter that had come up on the tailor job, Cole mounted his bike before he even decided to go for a ride. It was just habit, autopilot. Clarity and freedom came to him in the form of whipping wind, and his bike hummed under him as the world whizzed by. He didn't want to lose Jill, not now, not later to some disease either. He should have stayed and talked it out with her, but his emotions had taken over. His vision had just about crossed as he'd hurried down the stairs, trying to get away from her. He needed to be alone and think, yes, but was he running away? Was that what his bike was for, had been for, all these years? To run from his problems? No, he told himself. He needed to make sure he wasn't making the biggest mistake of his life. He tried to picture going back to the way life had been before he met her, and it looked dark and bleak, pointless. She was the bright spot in his life, making everything better. He wanted her with him, in his life, making memories and sharing things. But what if she got sick again? How would he handle it if she died? Could he survive losing her like that? People die every day, he told himself. They die from car accidents, they die from heart attacks, they die from hidden ailments all the time. So what? He wasn't supposed to take a risk and love someone just because there was a chance he'd lose her? No matter what came their way, he wanted them to go through it together. He drove past the bay, chasing the moon's reflection out on the water, and then drove some more, just to wash away the negative emotions. The entire night had been cleansing, and he felt like he had to pause and live it. After a while, he felt renewed and refreshed, ready to figure out what all of this meant. Then, suddenly, he felt guilty. He'd left Jill at home, hadn't even told her that he'd be back soon, and she was probably wondering where he'd gone, or worse. She might not be there at all anymore. He raced home, hoping she was there, feeling stupid for having abandoned her after he said he would take care of her. To make things worse, it was late, probably close to midnight. He'd lost track of time. He unlocked the door and threw it open. Jill. The condo was dark, save the kitchen light. He quietly entered the bedroom, hoping they could still talk. 
He'd tell her he was sorry for running out on her, but that he was ready and willing to take her on, to take love on. But she wasn't there. Cole flicked on the light. The bed was made. He saw none of her things. Nothing in the bathroom, either. Walking through the house, it was like Jill had never been there. Then he saw it, a piece of paper on the counter. Cole, I'm sorry I surprised you with my secret and that it upset you. I just wanted to be honest. It felt like things were at the point where you needed to know. Maybe it was too much, but I suppose we should be glad to know that sooner rather than later. I think it's best if I go home. Thank you so much for everything. Jill. Cole stared blankly at the wall. How had he messed things up so badly? The next morning, Jill dragged herself out of bed. Her body hurt all over like she'd just recovered from the flu. It could have been from driving so late at night, or it could have been from the motorcycle ride so soon after her hospital release, but she knew it was because her heart was broken. The best thing would be going back to work and putting her life back together. She could glue her heart together, too, if needed. When she managed to get up and about, she texted Liz. I'm back home. The security is installed. Let's talk at lunch about starting things up again. Then something else occurred to her. She still needed to plan for Cole selling her house, but not now. She wasn't ready to start thinking of her future, a future without Cole. Still feeling stiff, she ambled around her house. Someone had cleaned up. The bathroom wasn't in disarray, as she expected. It was like nothing terrible had happened there. As she turned to head back into the bedroom, she saw a black swatch of fabric sticking out from under her bed. It was a black baseball hat. She had never owned a baseball hat in her life. But she immediately knew who it belonged to. Monica's boyfriend, Trevor. She'd seen him wearing it the Monday he'd picked her up to head out for San Diego. They'd had a fight beforehand. Maybe they'd had a fight afterward and had never gone on their trip, after all. She wasn't sure. But she knew she'd seen Trevor wearing the hat before. He was the person who'd broken into her house. She immediately called the police and told them what she'd found. They sent an officer over to take the cap and her statement. After he left, she mulled things over, deciding it had been the right thing to do. She wouldn't call and talk to Monica about it herself. She'd let the police do that. Finding the cap and knowing the police were on their way to talk to Trevor made her feel better and in control again. She wasn't helpless. She had survived the break-in. She was strong. Sure, it had shaken her up and knocked her off her feet for a while, but anyone would react that way. It didn't mean that she was different now, weaker, or any less of a person. And the same would be true whether she decided to be tested for the genetic mutation or not, whether she tested positive or not. She'd do her best to be the person she always had been for as long as she could. In many ways, an average woman, but capable of love and occasional boldness. A tiny part of her hoped she could still find her wild side, even if Cole wasn't in her life. She had loved riding his bike with him. While at his condo, she had let herself dream about going on adventures with him, a cross-country trip, maybe on his Harley or flying to other countries. She shook her head and pressed back the tears. Maybe she could think about all that later on, without it hurting so much. For now, she needed to focus on moving on. The next day, Jill and Liz had the daycare up and running, though a few of the children wouldn't be back until the next week. It felt good to be working again and seeing her kids. Jill was able to put her emotional pain aside during work hours and just throw herself into the daily routine. She'd talked to Stanley's father that morning and made it clear she would not be accepting his dinner invitation, ever. He promised not to bring it up again, and after an initial awkwardness, things returned to normal. Monica's boyfriend, Trevor, confessed to breaking into her home. He and Monica had indeed gotten into another fight ten minutes into the drive to San Diego. 
He'd dropped her off at her house, and they hadn't seen each other since. Trevor had come back to Jill's house on his own. He'd claimed he hadn't meant to hurt Jill, but had panicked when she'd walked in on him. He was just looking for a stash of cash to keep up his meth habit. So her first day back on the job began with answers and closure. Not a bad thing. If only she could get that with Cole. But she wouldn't regret her time with him. She and Cole had enjoyed each other. He was an amazing man, but he was only human. She couldn't blame him for not wanting more with someone who might have medical issues down the line. She'd get through this. She was strong. But knowing that didn't help lessen the pain. Jill was getting the kids settled for lunch when Liz touched her arm. Listen, I'll take over for a while. Someone needs to talk to you outside. Jill walked to the front door, smoothing her hands down her work apron. She peeked through the peephole and saw... Cole. She opened the door slowly. He smiled. A slow, uncertain smile, but as he looked at her, his eyes lit up and the smile grew. Jill. He opened his arms and she flew into them. His warmth, his scent, his strength surrounded her. I'm sorry, he said. The other night. Well, can you come next door to talk for a few minutes? She looked over her shoulder and saw Liz nod and shoo her out. Jill turned back to Cole and stepped out onto her porch. He took her hand. Together, they crossed the lawns and entered his mother's house. It was empty inside, but he led her to the kitchen, then picked her up and set her on the counter. Standing in front of her, he took her hands. She got a sinking feeling in her stomach. Maybe he simply wanted to say goodbye in a better way but she didn't want goodbye. There's so much to tell you, he said, his voice sounding gruff, choked. First, I shouldn't have left that night, but I, I was struggling with what you told me. I'm sorry. She rested her free hand on top of their entwined fingers. It's okay. I understand you needed space to deal with what I'd told you. I needed to deal with that, yes, just like I've needed to deal with other things, too. What do you mean? After I found you gone, I panicked. I was afraid I'd driven away the most important person in the world to me. The way I reacted, it wasn't because I saw you as a burden, Jill. I believe in the words for better or for worse. Whatever the future brings, I'll always want to be here for you, taking care of you. I'd already decided that you're more important to me than any amount of traveling just like my mom was, but I'm not perfect. I feel like I let my mom down at the end, not being there for her. Oh, Cole, no. It's okay. I know I shouldn't blame myself, but I think I always will. The important thing is I know my mom loved me, that she'd never view me as a failure. And Jill, I think you can love me that way too, if you can just believe in me. I do believe in you, Cole, and I'm already falling in love with you. He cupped her face and rested his forehead against hers. I'm falling in love with you too, sweetie. She smiled once again at the endearment. They just stayed that way, faces touching, breathing each other in for several precious seconds, before Cole pulled back. I want to share something with you. The letter you saw, the one I'd torn in half... I taped it together and read it. You did? Yes. You gave me the strength to do that, Jill. You taught me to be brave, to face the future with open eyes and an open heart. And it turned out my father is someone you've heard of. Senator Taylor. Oh, wow! His face was impassive. She couldn't tell how he'd taken the news. I might be out of line, but Cole... Your mom would be so happy that you connected with him. What happened? How do you feel? Her words opened a floodgate. Cole started talking and couldn't stop. I thought if I ever met my father, I'd throw punches and tell him exactly what I thought of him. But I didn't. He traced the outline of her hand and occasionally brought it to his lips to press a kiss in the center. I understood why things happened the way they did. It still hurts, but... I'm happy I found him. My father. His voice changed as he said those words. 
All these years, his entire life, his father had been some nameless man who abandoned him. Now he had answers, possibly a relationship waiting for him if he wanted it. Did he tell you why he wasn't around? Jill asked carefully, not wanting to dredge up negative memories and make things worse for Cole. He was married. That's it. He has a family. Three kids. He loved my mom, but he couldn't. Cole couldn't finish his words. A wave of emotions hit him, and he pulled Jill close again. He couldn't leave his wife, his responsibilities. Jill finished for him. He nodded. But he said he thought about me all the time. He sent my mom regular checks to take care of me. I didn't know that, and when he and his wife divorced five years ago, that's when he started sending the letters. He wanted to make amends. He even talked to my mom directly. She told him she was dying, and she gave him my address so he could contact me after she was gone. He said she felt guilty about it, but she also said I'd understand. And I do. Oh, Cole. Jill said into his shoulder. Cole took a deep breath and pulled back slightly. Jill, he said, looking into her eyes. I don't know what the future holds for him and me, if we'll have any sort of relationship. But I feel like he was strong enough to come to me, to admit his mistakes, to claim me as his. And that's a start. She did nothing to fight the tears in her eyes. She was so happy for him. Cole stroked her cheek. He loved my mom and regretted the way things ended between them. I don't want that, Jill. I want you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Now the tears were flowing freely down her face. But my health, the risks, I don't care. He shook her hands in earnest. We'll take our chances, just like everyone else. But we'll have love. Everyone has a chance of getting something. It shouldn't stop us from being together. I won't let it. Relief swept through her. Not everyone finds someone like you, Jill Jones. Smash was right. You're the real deal. She giggled and sobbed at the same time. I'll spend every chance I get making you happy, Mr. Novak, she whispered. And I'll do the same for you, Jill. He pulled her into his lap and kissed her, gently but with real power, taking her breath away and igniting her passion at the same time. Epilogue Several weeks had passed since Jill's place had been broken into. Work kept Cole busy, but he'd been content with the job, probably enjoying it more than ever, simply because he knew when the day was over, his evening would begin with Jill. He'd finally gotten hold of Eric, but his friend's distant demeanor and refusal to talk about what had happened with Brienne had created a fissure between them Cole wasn't sure could be mended. Cole had talked to Luke about holding off expanding the business in San Francisco for now, maybe indefinitely, and Luke had been fine with that. He understood that chances like Jill came only once in a lifetime, so he was in no hurry to push him. Hey, did you go to sleep on me? Cole opened his eyes. Jill was back in their bedroom, wrapped in a towel with her long, wet hair laying against her shoulders. He forced himself out of bed and went over to the dresser where she stood. With her facing the mirror, he slipped his arms around her from behind and hugged her close, letting his lips touch the side of her face. She smelled so good. He closed his eyes and breathed in her scent. Jill had been completely fine with him putting off his move to San Francisco. In fact, she'd been so relieved she'd cried when he told her. But she hadn't been so understanding when he'd told her he was going to skip the ride home. She'd insisted he go. She never wanted to be a burden or limit what he could do in his life. At first, he'd resisted, but when she'd asked him point-blank if she wasn't in his life, would he want to go? He hadn't been able to lie. He did want to go on the ride. He just didn't want to leave her. Finally, he'd signed on, and truth be told, he had been looking forward to the trip. That had changed the closer it came to leave. What is it? She said. I don't want to go, he told her. You do too, she said with a little smile. You're going to have a great time. 
He spun her around to face him. I'm going to miss you like crazy if I'm away from you for a day. I can't go two whole weeks without you. Laughing, she stood on her tiptoes and kissed him. Thank you, baby, and I love that you feel that way, but I don't want to change who you are. She put her hand on his chest. This guy right here makes me happy. He makes me laugh. He makes me think. He makes me feel. He lights me on fire, and sometimes he drives me crazy. But given the chance, I wouldn't change a thing about him, including his love of adventure. That's who you are, Cole, and those guys are part of you, too. She winked. Have fun, explore, and be crazy. I'm not going anywhere. I promise I'll give you a big send-off, but first, I have some things to do today. With a face that could rival any of her daycare kids' pouts, he gave her another kiss and headed off for the shower. While he stood underneath the spray, he thought about those kids. They were awesome. He'd gotten used to seeing them every day and was going to miss them too, especially Stanley. He couldn't even think about the little guy without smiling. It was funny how much the kid reminded him of himself when he was little. Stanley had a natural curiosity that would undoubtedly lead him into some trouble as he got older, but with the right kind of support, the kid could also use that curiosity and thirst for knowledge to take him to great heights. Cole even spent some time with Stanley and his dad, Jason, who'd reluctantly accepted Cole was in Jill's life to stay. For now, Cole split time staying with Jill and his own apartment, but when the time was right, he was going to ask her to move in with him. Or, more accurately, ask if he could move in with her, since he felt more at home in her place than he ever had in his. He was about ready to place his mom's house on the market, and he was amazed how the thought of doing so didn't hurt him anymore. His mom would always be a part of him, and he'd always have great memories to see him through difficult times. As for his birth father, Cole was going to meet up with the senator in a few weeks. He wasn't sure what was going to come of it, but he was open to finding out. Mainly because he had Jill, and he knew with her by his side he could withstand anything. Once he was dried and dressed, he found Jill in the kitchen, going through cabinets and making a grocery list for the week. That hinge is loose, he said, watching her pull open the cabinet where she kept the cereal for the kids. Yeah, I guess it is a little, she said. I'll go get the toolbox and tighten it up, he told her. While I'm at it, I can fix that faucet in the bathroom. I noticed it was leaking yesterday when I helped Stanley wash his hands. Jill smiled at him. Okay, Mr. Fix-It, she said. I'm going to go shopping after I finish this list. Let me know if there's anything you still need for your trip. Do you want me to go to the store with you? He asked. Nope, you have a sink to fix, she laughed. And then you're going next door to start packing for your trip. Jill, she kissed him. I'll see you in a bit. Call me if you need anything. I need you, he said. Good, because I need you too. That's never going to change. He watched her go, loving the view as she did. When he was done fixing the cabinet and sink, he locked up Jill's house and got on his bike. Jill was going to be mad at him, but he just couldn't do it. He had too many things to stick around here for, mainly her. He would go to Liquid Cooled and let the guys know he wasn't going on the ride. She would be upset for a minute or two, but she'd get over it. She'd understand that he wasn't giving up what he wanted because of her. He was doing what he wanted. What he wanted was to be with her. When Cole pushed open the door of Liquid Cooled, he saw Smash, Stitch, and a guy named Dirty Dog, who they called Dee Dee, sitting at the counter. Hey, there he is, Smash said, looking at the bartender. Get him a beer. Nah, I'm okay, Cole said. I just came by to tell you I'm not going to be able to make it on the ride home this year. What? Why, man? Stitch griped. I just have too many things to take care of around here. You have to go, man. It's the trip of a lifetime, Stitch said. Dee Dee elbowed the old man. Ow, what was that for? 
Before either of the other two could say anything, Smash clapped him on the shoulder. Man, you're gonna disappoint someone if you don't go. You guys will have so much fun you won't even notice I'm not there. I'm not talking about us guys, Smash said. But there's someone else who was only going because you are. This person has been doing an awful lot of prepare for this trip, too. Well, pass on my apologies, Smash, because I'm not going. Smash looked toward the door that led from the bar to the clubhouse. Cole glanced over and couldn't believe his eyes. Jill was there, wearing a pair of dark, tight jeans, black leather riding chaps, and black leather boots. Her hair was pulled into a ponytail at the nape of her neck, and she wore a red and black skull cap on top of her head. She looked surprised to see him, then she smiled. Slowly, Cole moved toward her. Jill? What's going on? Why are you wearing that? Why? You don't like it? She pouted, her mouth looking luscious, layered with bright red lipstick. Of course I do, woman. On you, anything looks hot, but... Why the chaps? So I don't hurt my legs. You were supposed to be at home while I made sure I'd packed everything I need on my bike. Cole's head pounded with confusion, even as a glimmer of understanding teased him. What bike? My bike, she said with a grin. You want to see it? He stood there with his mouth wide open, so she took him by the hand and led him outside. The men at the bar grinned at him as he walked by. Out front, Jill led him over to a Harley that was just slightly smaller than the rest. It was customized and almost brand new. You like it? She bit her lip, her eyes gleaming. This is yours? The guys helped me pick it out. They did a lot of customization on it for me here in the clubhouse. Jill stepped up and put her arms around him. I wanted it to be a surprise. Surprise! The guys have been giving me lessons and I passed my writing test on the first try. I wanted you to be able to go on your trip, but I was hoping that if you didn't mind, I could go too. Of course you can go. You didn't have to do all of this. You could have ridden with me. She stepped back so she could look up at his face. I love riding on your bike with you, but I also want to ride beside you. Share the adventure, see the sights. I hope that's okay. Cole stood there quietly for a few seconds and let it sink in. Jill was going with him. Not only that, but she had done all of this for him, to show him how much she loved him. How amazing was that? Without warning, he scooped her into his arms and held her tight. Okay? It, no, it's not okay. It's perfect. He smashed a kiss into her cheek and finally put her down so she could breathe. What about the kids? She smiled. You know what I love? What? The way you say the kids instead of work. It tells me you really care for them. Liz's cousin is back in town. She has a degree in early childhood development, and she's going to help Liz while I'm gone. So, does this mean you're still going to give up the experience of a lifetime? Smash said from behind Cole. Cole grinned, pulled Jill to his hip, and kissed her on her ruby red lips. I have the best thing in my life right here, but so long as Jill comes with me, I'm up for an adventure. The first of many adventures in our lives. Right, baby? Right, Jill said. They kissed for several long moments, ignoring the catcalls around them. When Cole finally pulled back, he cupped Jill's face. Sweet and wild. I love you, sweetie. I love you, Cole. Now let's head back home and you can show me the chaps you're planning to wear on our adventure. Maybe if I'm lucky, they'll be the only thing you wear. Cole laughed. Something tells me you're going to be very lucky. And the only person that will ever be luckier than you, Jill Jones, is me. This has been Flirting with the Biker by Verna DePaul. Narrated by Ellen Lang. Copyright 2015 by Verna DePaul. Production copyright 2023 by Verna DePaul.